to you. I've been, um, Jamie's got them already. I emailed them to him yesterday, but let me, so actually the quickest thing for me is to just find that and forward it to you. Um, send items. Yeah, John, no, I, I'll, um, I'll send them around. I'll put them into the chat, okay? Okay, you've got them. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, we're live on YouTube, so we're good to go, John. Okay. Do you just want me to start? <clears throat> you don't need to say anything. No, nah, I think I think we're good to go. I think they're used to your dulcet tones. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, I can't do the polling. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm speaking to J Jamie. Yeah. I think he has to set me. He has to hand over hosting to me. Um, yeah. Can't remember what the first poll was anyway. But um, okay. I'll yeah, stop. we're just we're just getting the presentations as well to so we'll send the link in chat when they're posted. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Welcome everybody to the. The final one of this this trilogy. <clears throat> um, today we'll we'll just look at some of the sectors we've talked about. Um, we, in particular, industry, transport, and then heat and power. I've kind of grouped together. May, probably more heat than power, um, and then we'll have a bit of a sum up at the end. So, I guess again, it's it's a chance also to throw in any questions or comments that came out of the last couple of sessions as well, um, as well as obviously any questions and comments from this one. Uh, once again, if you can put your questions and comments in the Q&A window, uh, use the chat window if you're having kind of technical issues or other issues that you need to um, direct towards green power. Um, Alan's asked about the presentation. Uh, yeah, that it was available in the hydrogen heroes bit, um, but I think Jamie's gonna put up a link shortly to the, the presentation slides as well. So that should be up any moment. Um, also, hopefully at any moment, I'll be able to do some polling. Anyway, we'll maybe leave that till a bit later on. Okay, anyway, let's let's kick off. Let's get started. Um, so sectors, we talked about various ones yesterday, um, and one of them was industry. And in particular, there's we identified that there's really quite enormous market, even if we don't think about growth into new markets like transport and, and heat and sector coupling and all sorts of other, <clears throat> other weird and wonderful things. Um, even if we just wanted to replace existing use of just over 70 million tonnes per year of hydrogen, um, that's going to be, that in itself is going to be a struggle um, to get to in terms of scale, or at least it's, we can look at it two ways. It's not necessarily, it's, it's a huge market opportunity is the positive way to look at it. Um, and it's not something you're going to achieve overnight. It'll take a little while to even get to that is the other way of looking at it. So now I guess cost came up yesterday as one of the barriers. Um, why, why would companies who are quite happily using existing grey hydrogen, black, brown, whatever you want to call it, largely natural gas in most places. Um, China uses quite a bit of coal gasification to produce hydrogen. Um, but why would they switch from that to more expensive green or potentially blue hydrogen? Um, and that's a perfectly good question um, for, for those existing uses. I guess there are a few drivers because what we're seeing is that there are existing um, big hydrogen users, um, particularly refining, which I've mentioned on this slide, which have some quite ambitious projects in, in the pipeline in planning to try and move towards greener sources of hydrogen for refining. Um, there are <coughs> obviously uh, stakeholders, shareholders in particular. Um, if you're one of the oil majors, 
as opposed to the national oil company. So if you've got if you've got shareholders, you're potentially under quite a bit of pressure these days to have a, to at least have a strategy um, for where your business and where your industry is going to go in the future. I guess this is what I would we can identify kind of actual policy that drives people to do things because it's it's in place and it shifts the playing field. But I think there's also not just in this sector, but in, in large areas of, of clean energy. Um, there's also, I guess, what I would call um, or what would you call it? You could call it inferred policy um, or potential policy that also drives some of these decisions. So it's no good if you're one of these big companies, if the direction of travel is going to be towards penalizing companies that emit large amounts of carbon dioxide, then you could either wait until that happens and then suddenly scramble around to try and work out how to deal with it on the basis that we don't need to do it now because it's cheaper not to. Um, or you could get on and start planning for that. And in particular, you could get on and start understanding better the options and the um, technologies and how they perform and what choices you need to be making. Um, and in actual fact, you're probably going to be forced to do that if you've got shareholders and investors. So banks increasingly, and as I say, this doesn't apply just here, but it applies particularly for things like operators of coal plants. Investors are not, in this day and age, going to give you large amounts of money for something which they think, well, hang on a minute, in, there might not be policy now, but in five years' time, ten years' time, these plants might be... <coughs> Either if they're allowed to operate at all, they might only be allowed to operate with quite serious penalties around carbon price and so on. So there's a big there's a big element of even if things like carbon pricing doesn't exist yet, um, being aware of the direction of policy and strategies, net zero strategies and so on, um, and anticipation of these uh, anticipated policy is another way you could look at it, rather than actual policy. Um, and and with that. I think I mentioned yesterday, we get into requirements around things like diversification um, of, of your business. <clears throat> if you're going to survive into the long run and you want people to invest large amounts of money in your company and hold stocks in your company, then if you if you don't seem to have any plan for a, a future policy environment, then you, you've got a problem. So so in refining, there's, there's quite a lot of activity going on. Uh, I've picked out a few examples here. Um, BP and Shell in particular have been quite active. I mentioned um, a Philip 66 um, up in the northeast of England around the Humber area is another example of a hydrogen, um, big hydrogen cluster type strategy where they're looking at um, cleaning up their refining. Um, so there's plenty of things happening here. Um, as with, as with most of these things, there doesn't mean they're already using green hydrogen. It means they have um, they have plans to get there, and so you obviously have to then start looking at things like dates. So when are they when are they actually planning to start these things? Uh, so that the Shell one, which was announced as a, originally as a, as a very large, um, <clears throat> large and ambitious project, up to up to ten gigawatts of wind offshore wind eventually for hydrogen. Um, quite sensibly i would suggest has been in the short run um shell has been one of the bidders in an offshore wind farm auction in the netherlands um looking to on a much smaller scale produce hydrogen but in a, a smaller scale means they can do it more quickly um, and start using that specifically for their um their refinery um, around the rotterdam area as i say there, there are other examples other than the ones on here and then aside from individual companies and their individual facilities and trying to green those up and reduce their emissions. Um, the one on the bottom right, I think is interesting. I mean, that's, we're back into our issue of industrial strategy here. So specific, specific countries. So Singapore, if anyone has been to Singapore and um, stood around at the, um, the other side of the Marina Bay looking out to, to sea, um, one of the things you can see is a great big refinery, um, which is <laughs> slightly spoils the skyline, but anyway, so Singapore is a, is a has a big role in things like refining and also in in bunkering in basically storage um, and trading of um, fuels for things like shipping and so on. So as if, 
again, in a world where maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but going forwards, you're, there's going to be increasing pressure for things like not only refining to clean up, but things like shipping and so on to decarbonize as well. We'll look at shipping a bit later in this section. Um, also, it's going to start to tie into the industrial strategies of, of countries um, as to what the best way to do that. Do they just let that wither away and go into game software or something, or, or do they retain the skills, retain the people, um, but move, but um, transition into using the same skills, the same facilities, the same capabilities that they've got, all the supply chain stuff they've got set up um, to try and tweak that and move into a world where the fuel might be different. <laughs> um, so, so refining, um, quite a lot of use. Um, the other big use currently, of course, that we talked about was ammonia. Um, there are, again, it's more, <clears throat> It's more plans rather than actualities, um, but there are some some examples of of plans. Um, again, keywords things like could be built. <coughs> it's a lot of these things are feasibility study stage rather than um, financial investment decision stage. But again, it's it's one example of where um, you could produce green ammonia rather than current, if you like, grey or black ammonia, um, because the hydrogen is coming in this case from from solar. And you'll find, again, for the same reasons as refining, they're under pressure to start um, <coughs> cleaning up ammonia production. If not now, then they can see what's coming down the line. Um, and so these, <coughs> these are huge businesses. Someone came up with a number of whatever it was, $90 billion um, <coughs> industries between them, current hydrogen industry. So <coughs> 2.7 million on a on a feasibility study and then maybe a few <coughs> a few hundred million on on taking it forward is is it's not we're not talking about huge sums for um for some of these industries certainly as a as a hedge against um what might be happening with future policy and there are obviously um companies that are looking not just ammonia as um <coughs> fertilizer production which is the main thing here although this one um, is also this particular one in Australia um, is a big part of it which is to do with um, <coughs> mining customers but then you've got companies like Siemens looking at well they've already got um, using ammonia as a, as a fuel for power so um, they've already got combustion engine uh, they they're looking <coughs> they've got timelines for having ammonia gas turbines and so on um, and we mentioned yesterday that ammonia potentially is another one, another fuel that you could put into a, into a fuel cell. So, so that's an example where there's an existing ammonia industry, which is already very large, um, which as well as the current uses, people are also looking at other uses for, uses for ammonia as, as not just a feedstock for fertilizer production, but as a fuel in itself. I, and here we're talking about power, but as, as we mentioned yesterday or the day before, um, potentially using ammonia as a, as a shipping fuel, for example. Um, so that that would be a case of an existing existing industry, existing supply chain, but just growing that growing that industry, um, which, as I mentioned on my my chart yesterday about um, deployment challenges, supply chain ease of um, ease of deployment. That would be it's going to be a much easier task potentially to grow an existing industry than to start a a brand new one and grow an existing supply chain than to to build a new supply chain from scratch. <clears throat> now, one question I guess we can ask based on some of the stuff we thought about in terms of markets yesterday would be where are these things going to go so i mean if we think about existing refinery um <coughs> refinery production um i showed i won't zip back to it now but i showed a chart um at the start of yesterday which was the, the how current usage had grown um and you notice on that that ammonia Ammonia production was sort of growing a little bit. Um, refinery refinery demand for hydrogen had, had been going up quite steeply um, for the last um, the last several years. Um, now, I guess if you're looking further into into the future, you'd have you start to ask questions like, well, how big is that refining market going to be? And that depends on all sorts of factors. Um, the reason that the refining market has been going up quite substantially and actually going up at a faster rate than oil 
the oil supply and oil demand um, market has been a, a higher demand for more refined um, products, <clears throat> effectively. I mean, obviously what refining does is it takes your barrel of crude oil with all sorts of, um, <clears throat> which is not a very usable product in itself and it turns it into lots and lots of different um different fractions different and and also <coughs> it it also does um there's processes like cracking and, and ref reformation and so on where they kind of manipulate the mix of molecules that they want out of the other end depending on on customers um and that could be both fuel customers but also increasingly things like petrochemical customers as well so that's kind of increased the demand for refining so whether you think refining as a as a market is going to stay so we're talking about if we're talking about our 73 million tons what's going to happen to that current market size um you could argue that refining in the very long run <coughs> shouldn't have a future if we're going to wean ourselves off oil wean ourselves off fossil fuels but certainly in the short run there's no there's no real reason to think that um refining demand won't certainly stay the same and possibly go up a little bit because even if we have some substitution of fuels for things like transport so diesel and petrol we're, we're certainly not seeing a reduction in demand for things like petrochemicals <clears throat> so so that market you could look at that market and the drivers and so on but it's it's going to stay big i would suggest um so there's a there's a big opportunity there in moving those customers to, to green hydrogen um, ammonia i guess as i say if, if most of it is used for fertilizer you're looking at things like population growth um the requirement to feed people um but you're also looking so that would that would be a a positive if in terms of demand there's there's going to be a lot more people <clears throat> they're all going to want to eat they're probably going to want to eat more if we look at kind of historical precedent um on the flip side there is lots and lots of there's a whole world of agri-tech which probably doesn't get as much attention as, as maybe it should given how game-changing some of that could be um which is looking at how do we grow more stuff but use less inputs and that includes less water but it also includes less fertilizers and less chemicals so so again if if we have really transformative um methods for growing things then you could see um demand for ammonia um start to be affected by that but in the short run i would suggest these are going to remain they're going to remain huge markets <clears throat> and and as i say with ammonia if the demand for um fertilizer usage started to decrease then you could potentially replace it with some of these other uses of ammonia um a question has come in why would national oil companies noc decarbonize their hydrogen production no incentives unless there is some economic return now in the short term no carbon taxes to incentivize them no penalties yeah i mean the short answer is i mean national oil companies because they don't they're not driven by shareholders they're driven by the governments who own them so the short answer is why would they decarbonize it but they well two reasons um one if their governments decided to that that was the way they told them to go but why would governments do that really the answer to that is because if the market if their customers were demanding decarbonized hydrogen so if for example in the same way now with electricity um lots of big corporations are going around signing um power purchase agreements for renewable electricity and there are groups like re100 which is a bunch of very very big companies who have got commitments to become 100 percent renewable um the way that works of course is that they're not all hooked individually into specific wind farms and solar farms but there's a system of um renewable energy certificates there's a kind of administrative system that can audit whether um whether so that there's a kind of transactional basis the electricity comes through the same wire but transactionally the way the the way the, the payment works the way the, the commercial transaction works is that they can sign an agreement with a renewable power producer and so and so the payment goes towards increasing that um keeping and growing the renewable power production side of it so arguably one one thing that you might would certainly be helpful and i know there's a lot of work going on looking at how to do this 
is a similar thing for hydrogen. So how do you how do we certify that our hydrogen is is clean hydrogen? Um, if a molecule, if a cylinder of hydrogen arrives at your at your plant, then how do you know that that is is designated as clean hydrogen? Um, and again, it's potentially going to be people are looking at how you how you certify that, um, having some some system for um, certifying clean hydrogen, and there and if that then has a higher value in the market because companies are committed to reducing their emissions, and as part of that they commit to buying clean hydrogen hydrogen rather than dirty hydrogen, then that potentially increases the market value. There are obviously lots of challenges to that. Um, <clears throat> green hydrogen through electrolysis is not, not too difficult to certify, but things like um, blue hydrogen with carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and storage doesn't capture 100% of, of the carbon dioxide. Um, <clears throat> you'll see various figures, people claiming they can get up to 95%. In, re in reality, Lots of projects are probably doing more down at kind of 75%, that kind of number. Effectively, the more to get those, to get incrementally higher and higher percentage, you have to spend more and more money. There's a kind of diminishing returns on it. So how do, how do you start to certify that? Um, and also a system like that would probably have to be international because otherwise if we're talking about hydrogen economies in future where you've got importers and exporters, <coughs> It's no good one country having a kind of system in place for clean hydrogen um, if you can get around it simply by importing from somewhere else with producing it from natural gas for example so so that things like that we're going to have to have a bit of um we'll have to have some um there'll have to be international agreements in place but from a national company point of view um it's going to be driven by the governments and really from a government point of view unless those governments themselves have net zero bits which in the case of oil producing countries they're probably going to be um, amongst the the later ones to adopt that i would suggest um but what will drive it is customers so if customers are demanding or putting a higher value on um on clean hydrogen rather than um gray hydrogen and there's a, a method and there's a system in place to to certify that um beyond current industrial uses though i guess there's been what you'll see quite a lot of focus is on is this idea of hard to eliminate emissions. I showed you the there was a chart again at the start of yesterday where we've been reasonably good at decarbonizing electricity, uh, pretty hopeless at decarbonizing transport so far, um, and not very good at decarbonizing heat. And that chart was merely looking at energy, it wasn't looking at industry. So this is a picture that's a little bit old, so the percentages might have varied a little bit. Um, it's, I mean, it's not ancient, 2014, but it's, um, but it, they won't have changed, they've not changed dramatically. And also you'll see different pictures with slightly different percentages. But what, what leaps out is things like um, transport over here. Um, now you see road transport, relatively small, that little slice there. Um, things like aviation and shipping, um, really, and this is in global terms, big emitters. Um, <clears throat> short distance light road transport. So that's your, that's everyone in their private cars commuting about. I mean, that's a big chunk, which is why obviously we get into things like our electric electric cars and <laughs> or, or fuel cell cars. Um, <clears throat> Heavy, heavy road transport again. Short. It's what strikes you here is that it's the short distance stuff um, that really stands out in terms of, of emissions. Uh, they've got they've got electricity in here, um, load following. So that's kind of peak peaking plants, that kind of stuff. Um, but then there's some sectors that really stand out. So iron and steel is a big one. Um, cement another another big one. So <clears throat> aviation gets lots of lots of stick and lots of criticism for um, emissions and so on. Um, but both cement and iron and steel are more than twice um, as much in terms of emissions. Now, you can obviously also have to look at not just emissions at the current time, but also growth rates and so on. One of the one of the big issues with aviation was not just around current emissions, it's around, well, it was, <laughs> it certainly was until recently around the rate at which it was growing. Now, um, the, that may have changed going forwards. 
um, not necessarily for for good reasons, but potentially with um, with reasonable reasonable side effects, if you like. <laughs> um, so there are some other industries which not only have very large emissions, but also are going to be quite hard to um, to replace those emissions. <laughs> um, so. And there's been lots of people looking at um, how you might do that. So this chart comes from a report um, published only just recently, um, I think only a few weeks ago um, from the Grattan Institute um, based in Australia. And they were looking at um, Australia in terms of its Australia is a big kind of commodity producer. It also has fantastic renewable um, energy resource, um, solar and wind in particular. Um, so they were looking at, OK, again, industrial strategy, um, government economic strategy. Um, let's not <clears throat> this is this is an opportunity. Can we can we make money out of this? And so, again, there's some slightly different numbers that they came up with. So steel, uh, they reckon was was seven percent, which is higher than the other thing. Um, but also we we're talking about market value. I mean, it's a big, big market. Um, cement <clears throat> again in here, uh, they came with just. For a, just over four and a half percent. Again, both much bigger than um, than aviation and, and shipping and so on as well. Um, so, and they've got ammonia down here at the bottom. So, so these are big, big markets. There's lots and lots of um, money involved, and there's lots of lots of emissions involved. So, and one of the things they were interested in was, <coughs> and a point they were making, in terms of the, the commodities value chain. There's been lots of talk about, for example, producing hydrogen in Australia and then shipping it to Japan or shipping it to other places or building. I mean, there's some big projects which, again, proposals rather than finance projects, looking at doing things like big electricity interconnectors to Singapore to um, export electricity. Um, but they made the point, well, hang on a minute, why don't we, rather than <clears throat> export our raw material, in this case, energy, be it hydrogen or electricity, um, and then let someone else do the value add in terms of generating the steel or the cement or whatever, the, the commodities that um, they can sell on, wouldn't it be better if we made them here in Australia and then sell the commodities? <laughs> and again, that's that's going to be, I mean, it seems seems like a fairly, fairly good point. Um, and that's the kind of calculation, again, that at policy levels you, you'd hope um, policymakers are also looking at. And so in that sense, if you've got extremely good resources to produce uh, electricity and, and hydrogen, um, then that could particularly have a shifting impact on on gl global trade in terms of commodities and so on. Um, I'll, there's a couple of questions I'll take while they've come in. Um, Sebastian, I'm going to read them again because I'm not sure everyone can see them. Uh, well, looking... John, so I was just going to jump in as well quickly. Yeah. Um, the polls should all be there for you now. Um, okay. You've got access as well. Okay, just so you know. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. I'll come back to the polls. Um, so Sebastian asked, while looking at carbon reduction, I see some oil and gas companies looking into levelized cost of carbon mitigation, especially while exporting solution to reduce refining footprint. Pyrolysis seems to be more cost competitive than electrolysis and efficient in reducing emissions. Why don't we see more pyrolysis demonstrators and projects? Uh, that's a perfectly good question. Um, yeah, I mean, levelized cost, it's something I've, I do quite a lot with um, in terms, I've certainly done quite a lot with it in terms of electricity. Uh, and also you can do it within with hydrogen as well. Um, there are, I'd have, I mean, to comment on pyrolysis looking more comp cost competitive, I'd really have to examine the um, the calculations to to agree or not with that. Um, having done lots of levelized cost calculations myself, um, you depending on the assumptions you make, you can come up with um, lots of wildly different numbers. Um, I think pyrolysis, I guess, because at the moment it's a it's it's a bit more niche. Um, it's whether it's more efficient in reducing emissions, yeah, I mean, it will depend on a number of factors. It will depend on the feedstock you're talking about, because you can do pyrolysis with lots of different um, feedstocks. 
it will depend on things like whether what cost assumptions you make on taking it from current scale up to bigger scale um, because it's um, it's obviously then you're talking about um, scaling up industrial facilities which is not not as simple as, as often people think it's going to be so why don't we see more good question um, I'm, I'm I'm always happy to see different technologies being demonstrated and and um, I'd rather see them demonstrated and on on the ground so we can compare them rather than just sort of talked about in the theory and on, on calculation so so i mean if it, if it does look co more cost competitive i'm sure we will i guess is, is the other way to answer that question um and while i'm in the q a window uh, john as a non-techie i'm trying to understand the relationship between hydrogen and ammonia um i believe three molecules of hydrogen produced by green by whatever process are bound to one molecule of nitrogen to become ammonia. Uh, this can be used as a fertilizer, blah, blah, blah. However, is ammonia also used as a carrier, which can be dissembled to become hydrogen? Um, uh, yes, well, yes to most of that. Um, so ammonia, um, so ammonia is NH3, so three atoms of hydrogen, uh, one of ammonia. Um, so to produce hydrogen, um, yeah, to produce ammonia, sorry, yep, yeah, you have a source of um, a source of hydrogen, and then you take nitrogen out of the out of the air, and there are various um, established industrial processes, chemical processes to do that, um, with various um, issues around heat and efficiency and so on. So yes, you could that you can produce ammonia now. Then you can either use that directly as a as a kind of feedstock into um, other other chemical processes, including um, fertilizer, um, but yeah, you could you could then transport that, and then at the other end, you can split that out back into you can you can go the other way and <clears throat> produce it, split it back into uh, nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, again, that you, there would be an energy efficiency loss in doing that. Um, that goes back to what we talked about on the first day. Why would you why would you go through two <clears throat> um, to chemical processes with all the kind of energy efficiency and plant overheads and, and economics involved with that to produce ammonia, transport ammonia, and then split it out again at the other end. Um, <clears throat> the answer might be if, depending on the distance and the cost, that ammonia is easier to transport than liquefied hydrogen, for example, and you're going and, and you're going by ship rather than pipeline. Um, <clears throat> or it might be that you combine that with ammonia being a fuel. For the for the boat as well so but yeah the relationship is is that um other examples of hydrogen use in the mining sector um iron extraction mining um i've i've heard of mining companies looking at using hydrogen more actually as a a balancing mechanism for the, the pa their power production. So if they're moving over, if they're trying to replace things like fuel oil or gas usage for their power draw, which is enormous and, and very kind of baseload steady um, requirement. I've certainly heard of mining companies looking at using hydrogen on the power side to kind of balance things like solar and wind investments. Um, I think there are some, I don't know, I don't think in commercial usage yet, but there are some companies obviously looking at things like fuel cell trucks for mining. You've, there, are, there are already battery, lithium ion battery trucks for mining. Um, so the huge vehicles driving around the mining site. So that will be another, that will be another, another aspect of mining. Um, but again, I'm, I think these are, these are more kind of, I'm not aware of any mines currently using, um, using hydrogen, but that's they're the kind of they're the two areas that hydrogen is in discussion is is the massive trucks that drive around and as a as a fuel source um using ammonia as a fuel um it can be combusted um and yes you wouldn't produce carbon dioxide you'd produce nitrous oxides um which obviously is one of the things that produces smog um, but you can also use ammonia um, in fuel. There are you can develop fuel cells. The semen slide earlier um, I mentioned developing fuel cells that run on ammonia, uh, which would actually be a more efficient way of um, you get in terms of producing electricity and spinning something 
So having effectively ending up with an electric fuel cell ship rather than a conventional um, <coughs> a conventional ship using a petrol or diesel engine or, or in case of very big ships, a gas turbine. <coughs> so so you can combust it or you can or you can stick it in a fuel cell. There are different different options for doing that. Okay. <coughs> um, so Australia making the point that big usages and potential export opportunities there are things happening again these are this is all kind of early stage demonstration proposals that kind of stuff um when looking around the market um ssab um the s is for sweden i'm not sure what the other bits are for uh, swedish steel probably <laughs> although it's probably in in swedish so it may not be that simple um but <clears throat> they they're probably the company that have had the most um, in terms of at least statements about where they're going to go, um, most advanced. Um, but again, to get an idea of timescales, um, zero carbon steel by 2025. So this isn't something that's happening now or was going to happen tomorrow. Um, there are various ways that hydrogen potentially could be used in, in steel, um, tied into the various ways that we get carbon emitted from steel. Um, with steel making, you're, you're basically talking about going from iron ore, which is iron oxide, and you want to get it to just plain old iron. So you need to strip out the oxygen. And one way to do that is to um, use coke, use carbon or coal, and you strip out the oxygen as carbon dioxide, of course. Um, so that's one way to go. Um, another way, of course, would be to use hydrogen and strip it out as uh, water so that would that would save you your carbon emissions so that that's one aspect in terms of the actual um <clears throat> the iron going from iron ore to iron um but there are also um <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of other then bits of processes in terms of iron steel and so on <clears throat> um but there's also there are in terms of commercial um for people that's saying what it is being used um this one was an example where they're not using hydrogen to as a as a kind of chemical agent if you like to do the iron ore to iron processing but they're using it just as a heat um so there's there's an example here again in sweden um, where they are using hydrogen as the heat source replacing natural gas um to heat up the steel in the rolling mill the rolling mill is just where they turn <clears throat> they they basically roll out sheets of, of steel um, so again, that's another way you can use it, and you're replacing, you're replacing using a fossil fuel just for heating. So there's there's, there's kind of two main elements. Do um, <coughs> describing steel making very simplistically. There's there's the chemical um, aspect of it in terms of um, reducing the iron ore to iron, and then also there's just the energy replacement for heat um, heat usage in, in steel mills. Um, there are, I mean, there are other ways. It's again, it's not a completely um, uncompetitive market. There are um, obviously things like there are things like plasma arc heating uh, using electricity. There are also various there are various other kind of technologies people are looking at um, for um, reducing iron ore um, without in non chemical ways. Um, again, using electricity. So so again, it's not got the market to itself, but they're the kind they're the kind of two broad things now. Again, this is from that same Australian study, the chart at the bottom. Um, one point they made was that at, at, at low um, low cost hydrogen, so this is our or grey hydrogen, if you like, um, the, the dark red bar, um, adding, it was adding about 20% to the cost of producing steel and actually not very much to the cost of producing ammonia. So if you can, um, if you could produce, sorry, so this is the premium. So that's saying if, um, if green hydrogen was say two dollars a kilogram compared to grey hydrogen at one dollars a kilogram you'd add about 20 percent to the cost of steel as your as the premium for green hydrogen gets bigger and so now it's say four dollars a kilo rather than one dollars a kilo um actually in steel making you get less of a premium then on the product you're selling than you do with ammonia ammonia very quickly um adds up um but that's i mean that's still quite a big premium and if we're talking about so if we're talking about grey a base of grey at one dollar this would be green at, at four dollar um there are not at the moment that's that's pretty that's pretty cheap it's not there's there's 
<clears throat> there's not really many places where you're going to be producing uh, green hydrogen for four dollars and it's still quite a big chunk of extra cost on steel so again you're going to have to it's not just whether the um, processes work and exist it's going to be very much driven by whether customers are prepared to buy that green steel whether there's any example um any examples of customers or any um <coughs> pressure from customers to um to buy steel which has a lower carbon footprint and that in turn will go right along the supply chain potentially to for example car manufacturers um, if you're selling a what you're calling a, a a green electric car but it's made from steel that has a big carbon footprint then maybe in future those car manufacturers to differentiate themselves will also be prepared to pay a premium <laughs> because they can maybe add that premium to the cost of the car to buy green steel. So again, that's the point that we can talk about the production side, but ultimately this is going to be driven from the purchase side. So with all these, all these, whether they're industrial uses or the other uses, we need to also think, okay, who's going to drive this? Where's the demand going to, um, going to come from? Um, someone's asked specifically, Lema has asked specifically about Hydrogen in Latin America. Um, yeah, I'm not. I, I've heard of the odd pro program project in Chile, which the, um, as you say, the post on the Hydrogen Heroes forum made. Um, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm. I've not seen much coming out of Latin America. Um, so yeah, I'd certainly Uruguay, Costa Rica. I, yeah, I'm not aware of um, specifically those countries. Um, so to Chile, Chile, I've seen one or two, and again, that's driven by um, things like um, very, very cheap solar electricity, very good solar resource, um, and and also potentially tying in with things like mining applications and so on. Okay, um, Sebastian, outside Australia, uh, green hydrogen production may be motivated by a strategy to relocate industrial production as part of a clean econom economic recovery plan. Have you seen some national EU strategy motivated by this objective? Does it make sense in countries where the renewable energy capacity is not as competitive as in Australia? Um, yes, the certainly, ooh, that question's just disappeared again. That's weird. Um, <clears throat> I think I can remember it. Certainly in, <clears throat> there was a, as a kind of leak of a report um, about the EU and what they're planning to do going forwards um, and hydrogen certainly featured in that as one of the sectors that potentially gets funded and in particular it was talking about hard to decarbonize sectors so there was funding in there there was also funding there for things like electric car charging um, and electric cars more on the battery side um, but hydrogen got a specific mention and some specific numbers around hard to decarbonize areas so um in in the uk in the net zero document that was published um a year and a bit ago which sort of drove the government towards setting a target um there is some specific stuff around hydrogen now that uh, di different countries have slightly different um different objectives and different views on that um there's been stuff coming out of Germany about using hydrogen for industrial decarbonization, uh, but also doing deals with countries like Morocco to import hydrogen, so to produce it overseas and import it, um, because on the basis that it's cheaper to produce um, in North Africa, we talked about that a little bit yesterday, and then import it. Whereas in the UK, <coughs> that same document I just mentioned was very, made some very specific comments around if they're going, if you're going to go down the hydrogen route, not avoiding a situation where you just become dependent on hydrogen from elsewhere. <clears throat> so if you like, you switch your dependency from things like oil and gas imports to hydrogen imports. So that was that was a bit more specific about saying, well, energy security has to be part of this decision. So so it's kind of I think at the moment, I would say most countries are kind of formulating there's been lots of strategy documents but there's been not <clears throat> there's been less in them in the way of solid policy announcements um 
again, if I look at the UK, there's, there's been some funding, there's some money going into hydrogen, relatively small amounts in the grand scheme of things, but that again has been going very much into industrial uses. Um, in And that's included things like steel makers, uh, chemical companies, um, that kind of thing. So, uh, What do I mean by green steel? Um, I mean, so the, what this is meaning is it's, it means steel that is <coughs> produced um, uh, produced using hydrogen rather than replacing coke and coal. So um, I, I don't know what the precise definition whether they mean completely zero carbon steel, or whether they um, they just mean or whether um, they're just replacing the part of the process with hydrogen. But that's that's kind of what it means to so cleaner steel. And and what they're saying here is that as, as the price premium between green hydrogen and non green hydrogen goes up, it has less of an impact on steel production than it does on ammonia production. Okay, um, and Jeff asks, in your experience, which part of the supply chain would be most attractive to investors? Uh, we'll maybe come back to that when we kind of <clears throat> sum up at the end. Um, does green steel mean any kind of hydrogen? Um, no, it certainly you wouldn't mean grey hydrogen. We're talking about it have to be it have to be low carbon, zero carbon hydrogen. So it'd have to be grey or blue. That's the short answer to that one. Again, with all the issues around how you how you certify that. Oh, blimey, let's crack on. Um, so steel, um, cement was the other one we, we mentioned. Again, cement, there's, um, there's various elements to the cement process. Um, but again, one of the key things is that a chunk of it often involves um, coal usage um, to produce, as a really to produce heat. Um, and then there's there's also uh, various other um, <clears throat> other sort of chemical bits and bobs along the way. So again, with cement, there are I'm not aware of a cement plant yet um, that is using hydrogen, but it's because of the um, emissions footprint of cement. Um, and I mean, this is quite a scary quote. I've not I've not checked the numbers myself, but um, the world's second most consumed substance after water. Now that's <laughs> That sort of made me sit up and think a little bit, which I mean, it explains certainly why the footprint is so big. So there are very, again, there are various ways within the um, within the cement um, production chain. The obvious one is as a just as a heat source, using hydrogen as a heat source rather than than burning coal as a heat source. Um, so <clears throat> there have been studies looking into that. There are some. Um, I know there's some of the big cement companies are, are obviously looking into that for the same reason that refinery companies and steel companies are looking into that. Um, policymakers are, are starting to look at these segments which emit a lot um, and are like to start putting pressure onto them. So there was this same um, same organisation here in the UK that did a did a they did a feasibility study looking at uh, not just hydrogen but other things. So again, plasma, which is basically electrification. Um, and they also used uh, biomass. And in fact, they came up with <coughs> with a whole bunch of assumptions. Um, you, replacing coal <coughs> uh, with a mix. Um, and actually the mix was, a lot of it was biomass in this case, 20% uh, hydrogen, 10% electrification um, as what they called their optimum. And now we could argue about what optimum meant, um, <coughs> lowest emissions, lowest cost. Um, and but they're taking that study forward. There are actually some trials in place. So um, Hansen Cement is part of, um, is it Semex or is it, I can't remember, it's one of the big international um, cement companies. So so that's that's gonna be happening. Um, <clears throat> it was due to start happening this year. So so you're starting to see, again, this thing, this kind of thing isn't commercial yet, but you're certainly seeing um, projects start to happen. Um, and again, it's uh, as with steel, a big chunk of it is replacing carbon usage for thermal, um, in the case of steel, also for the chemical side of it, with something that doesn't, you don't have that carbon problem. Because the alternative, of course, for cement plants or steel plants is that when they produce their CO2 is, is um, to have carbon capture and storage. So that's, if you like, that's the, that's the competition, or one element of the competition is to carry on, um, leave the process as it is, and spend money on capturing and storing the carbon. Um, so what will be 
what will decide where a lot of this goes is which is which is cheaper <laughs> is it cheaper to just do what you're doing now and capture carbon or is it cheaper to go and um to buy green hydrogen or produce your own green hy cream hydrogen clean hydrogen and use that instead so it'll, it'll come down to economics and practicalities um and obviously these industrial uses that's where we get into um the idea of clusters hydrogen clusters hydrogen hubs whatever you want to call them um <clears throat> this is one example which is looking they're looking to do in the um the northwest of of england but there are clusters proposals around as i say around rotterdam we've talked about um there's a whole number in the uk south wales is looking at doing clusters as well and and precisely what the cluster looks like will depend on what's already there and so in in the northwest of england for example um there are already um there's already gas production out here in the um in the irish sea there are plans in future for offshore wind production as well um, so we've got source of feedstock, if you like, for hydrogen production. Because gas production is declining, um, you've also got somewhere to potentially store your carbon. So if you like reverse, <clears throat> instead of pumping gas out, um, pumping carbon in. There's also a whole bunch of industrial um, usage. There's, <clears throat> there's, I mean, I, I actually grew up in a place called Witness, which is kind of just somewhere around about here on the map. <clears throat> um, there's around the river here there are some very big um, chemical plants refineries um, all sorts of other kind of industrial usages and so the idea of positioning here it's not it's not a random decision um, they're talking about producing hydrogen because there's lots of companies close by that could use it to decarbonize um, and tying that in with the fact that they've got um, a source of feedstock and potentially somewhere to um, also do carbon capture and store and also they've got big cities so liverpool Manchester, both big population centres, Chester not so much, um, but lots of people, urban areas where in future potentially then you get into all sorts of things like hydrogen fueling, hydrogen trains and, and so on and so on. So, and there's, so that um, they've, they've written, obviously, we get back to people making money at the moment, consultants writing reports and so on. Um, here, here's a chart from one of those um, initial feasibility study reports and and so there's some detail in here and I'm not going to read through every bullet point on this slide but you can see um, they're talking about using uh, gas reforming they're actually using not conventional steam reforming but this ATR uh, reforming which allows higher carbon capture that's the kind of capture rate they're talking about 93 percent um, <clears throat> Now, you'll see someone mentioned levelized cost of hydrogen um, earlier on. They're talking about that costing £38 per megawatt hour. And at the time they wrote this, that was getting on for two and a half to three times um, the, the cost of natural gas. So it's not, it's not a cheap substitute. And actually, natural gas has, has fallen in price since then. So this is going to need a premium. And they, in terms of what that costs, in terms of cost of capturing carbon that's over here on the left um 100 114 pounds per ton now that's that's a lot um if you look at the kind of carbon prices people are maybe talking about need about being able to um, implement then they're certainly not they don't tend to be that high um so it's not it's not a cheap way of doing it but it's first of its kind project um the idea is that unless you start building these things um you don't know how they work you can't optimize them you can't learn from them and so on so again it's it's quite a it's a cluster picture um you've got production uh, you've got um companies industry usage of hydrogen um, so that in the short run, it's really this this part of it. The that's a kind of the domestic side is a kind of longer term goal, um, and then also because it's using natural gas, you've got the whole carbon capture bit of it in there as well. So anyway, I'll leave you to you can look at the numbers at your leisure. And again, just to <clears throat> try not to be too UK centric, um, this is quite a, kind of an interesting one again from an industrial um, clustering perspective um in in germany um there's a refinery up here so that's the danish danish border <coughs> so germany at the bottom denmark up here um again it, it's a kind of i like this because it's kind of 
it's ambitious um, in the long run. It, it's not it's not desperately ambitious in the short run. So they're talking about relatively modest amount of electrolysis by 2025, and that really is to is to provide hydrogen to this refinery to um, to decarbonize the the refinery. There's some interesting stuff in here though as well. They're talking about um, selling the oxygen to a cement plant. So cement plants use oxygen as as um, part of the um, as the fuel in their in their process. Um, so that's an idea. That's an example of tying in two two different industrial um, customers um, and having synergies between the two of them. So you produce hydrogen for one plant, uh, the oxygen you produce from electrolysis you use for, for the other plant. Um, waste heat. We've talked a little bit about waste heat again um, over the last couple of days and, and potentially the importance of that from an economic point of view. But this is the key one. I mean, this isn't the idea of this is not that they think it's immediately a, a commercial proposition. It's about learning about these things. Um, but then in future, they've got they've got sort of grander plans and and then we're, they get also talking about things like producing sin fuels with it in future um, and again it's tying things together so the source of the carbon to produce your sin fuel would actually be carbon dioxide coming out of the again the cement plant so so it's, a, it's an interesting interesting one because they're they're starting small on one site, but they're it's kind of strategically located because as it says even if the even if the um, carbon, if the things like aviation fuel turns out to be a pipe dream, uh, they've got a lot of local industry uh, close by, so they don't need to start building hundreds of kilometres of um, of hydrogen grid, for example, to do that. Um, they've also got salt storage, so there's there's a whole bunch of things that come together in this particular site, uh, which potentially make sense from a, a clustering point of view. Okay. Um, the burning coal in cement is just for heat, or is there a chemical reaction requirement with coal? As far as I'm aware, in cement, it's it's basically just a heat source. Um, I, I'd have to go and revise my <coughs> chemical processes of cement making, but I, I think in cement it's just the heat source. You're not, uh, in, whereas in steel, it's a, it's a reduction agent to strip out the oxygen. Um, Plasma electrification and um, plasma is um, well, my very simple explanation. Um, things like plasma arcs, which they use for um, cutting steel and so on. Plasma is basically two electrodes, and you put a huge voltage through them, and you basically get a, an electric um, arc between the two. A, like a, a bolt of lightning if you like um and so and what that does is it's around the around that around that electric arc um it basically you you turn the air into a plasma very high temperature um so just massively high temperature which you can then use to um either cut things heat things uh whatever else um it's been there's plasma there's a process, process called plasma gasification that you might come across with hydrogen. I posted up a story on the network uh, the other day about a company looking at using that for producing hydrogen from waste. Um, there are plasma gasification plants that use um, that use that technique to deal with solid waste currently. Um, it's expensive, but what it, it can you can sort of break down pretty much anything and so they use it for sort of difficult to handle waste things like medical waste they use it for destroying chemical weapons that kind of stuff so it's it's a it's a technology that um that exists already I don't know, my diagram there is probably not very informative but anyway um <clears throat> Paolo says, without strong carbon penalties or cost of production use, uh, offshore power at £60 per megawatt hour will not replace turquoise or blue hydrogen. How can that work as a replacement without government strong intervention? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, offshore power is cheaper than that uh, nowadays. Um, the, or at least the upcoming wind farms in the UK, the auctions reached last, the end of last last year for farms coming in, wind farms coming into play in 2023-24, we're down at 40 pounds per megawatt hour. Um, but you're right, I mean, if there's a, in in any reasonable um, 
time period, um, you're not going to get the costs of green or or green um, hydrogen down to the costs of well, I mean, I turquoise or or blue. Um, blue, you'd have to be very dependent on what your cost of carbon capture and storage is, but certainly you're not going to get it down to the cost of grey hydrogen anytime soon. Uh, so, so yeah, people on why would people pay more for it without unless they're unless they're forced to, and they're not going to be forced to without as without government um, policy intervention. So, I, I think you're right. Policy policy is going to be crucial to this, um, along with and <clears throat> in parallel with, as I say, things like shareholder pressure. Um, for particularly for these heavily carbon intensive industries, uh, which shareholders, even if policy is not there now, shareholders see the direction of travel. Um, yeah, turquoise hydrogen, I mean, I've not seen any good figures for pyrolysis, um, cost of hydrogen from pyrolysis. Um, if you if you've got some, then post them up. It'd be interesting to to see. Um, it's this it's so <coughs> it's so kind of small scale emerging at the moment I think it's quite hard to come up with a commercial figure and blue hydrogen as I said depends on the cost of carbon capture and storage how much premium that adds on to the cost of grey and carbon capture and storage again is not gonna it's not gonna happen un unless there's a kind of policy requirement to do it so so yeah, you're right I think I mean ultimately if policymakers say well it's all too expensive. We'll just keep burning the dirty stuff. Then, and then yeah, this isn't going to go anywhere. But I would, I would suggest that there's enough evidence that um, uh, that policymakers will start to force the issue a bit. Okay, and so this last one again, I think, just makes the point that uh, with industry, what, however you're producing the hydrogen, looking at industries tend to cluster anyway for reasons around. Um, access ports um roads pipelines um the um, proximity to demand centers um all sorts of reasons why they cluster anyway so and so that, again i think this last one's interesting and worth looking at whether it eventually happens or not to the scale they're talking about because of some of the ideas they've got around how you how you create synergies between an input for one industry becomes an output into another one um, and so you can you can almost start to get these kind of circular um, flows of of, um, of material um, around the, around the place so and, and that will be key because obviously the more the more you can do that it the more it's going to the more economic it's going to make it of course if you're too dependent then I get I guess you could argue that there start to become risks involved there as well um, so here, what does this all fall to bits if the, um, if for example, the, um, the cement plant goes out of business? Um, you also have to look at the risk profile and how dependent you are on particular, um, particular partners to do that. Okay. So let's crack on into transport um i think i think we're okay on questions uh, actually let's before we do that i was going to launch this at the start but i'll launch it now we'll just do a quick poll just to check that people are people are alive <coughs> alive and awake so if you go ahead and vote Note it says you're most excited about. It doesn't necessarily mean you're. <laughs> okay, I'll give you another 10 seconds and then we'll close it. Okay, seem to have stopped. Okay, <laughs> the results. Okay, so what have we come up with? So oh, that's an interesting, um, it's an interesting mix. So <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it's 
it's often quite hard to get excited about industries which already use hydrogen because they're <clears throat> this it's always more exciting if something's new um <clears throat> but i would suggest that it's a massively important segment as, as we said yesterday you could um we could create huge growth in clean hydrogen even without addressing any new applications really just by fulfilling those uh, new industrial usage hydrogen cars come out comes out pretty low we'll we'll come on to that um when we talk about transport now other transport applications um it comes out much higher hydrogen power or chb oh that's interesting okay we'll come on to that towards the end <clears throat> okay good let's close that for the moment okay show that one later right okay so on that score let's um Let's go on to transport, but not have a break midway through transport. Um, this is a chart that hydrogen people generally hate to see, <laughs> um, the, um, but it's it appears all over the place. Um, this is the the chart that kind of looks at the end to end energy efficiency. So um, you're basically looking at if you've got 100% renewable electricity, so you've got a wind farm, solar farm, whatever it may be and you stick that into a into an end-to-end -end system how much of it do you get out at the other end in terms of turning the wheels of a car or or a n other vehicle um and again we can argue about we could argue about the specific numbers um so for an electric car um you you produce electricity you're not worrying about electrolysis uh, don't worry about that one because the chart actually had another bit which was looking at synthetic fuels um they've got five percent energy losses that will be in the grid now that will be i would say that's a bit bigger than that um if you look at grid losses um in markets like the states and the uk and presumably germany are the ones um that more like kind of six to eight percent maybe by the time you get end to end uh, and then you've got it arrives at the other end uh, you've got losses um within the various losses within the car itself and then um and the motors if you like the engine <laughs> it's the motors um, but you still get a big chunk of it out at the other end um the problem with a fuel cell vehicle fuel cell car is that you start up with your electricity um electrolysis they've they've got 30 percent losses so we could argue well maybe that's maybe that's a bit generous on that let's make that 20 percent if we've got an 80 percent efficient electrolyzer in the future um this one now that becomes significant because this is again this is transport storage and distribution i mean that's a that in itself is a good argument to say well <coughs> can't we just bin all that and have the electrolysis on site i mentioned that yesterday when i mentioned about uh, the trucking company nicola um what they're doing with their hydrogen filling stations is they're not producing hydrogen centrally somewhere and then shipping it out to the various filling stations they are um, they've got a grid connection to their filling stations they're doing on-site electrolysis um so they're so you cut out a reasonable chunk of that now you could argue that you maybe have to have your your five percent then um before you before you get to your electrolysis so again you can play around with the figures but one obvious thing to cut out is this one so to um, produce the hydrogen on site would make a lot of sense in that sense um and then the other big one is this is your fuel cell so that's the hydrogen back to electricity um and that's saying 50 percent um efficient electrolyzer again maybe we can be generous and say we've got a 60 percent efficient electrolyzer uh, sorry not electrolyzer fuel cell so maybe we can reduce that to 40 percent um and so we can go down and maybe that one needs to go down a little bit and maybe that one needs to go up a little bit we can run through the numbers um but even with the best will in the world and bending the figures in your favor as as much as you possibly can um the, you can't really argue that end to end if you start off with renewable electricity and you end up with spinning a motor to turn some wheels <laughs> that hydrogen is more few it's more energy efficient than um going through electricity and batteries <laughs> it's that's simply the um, <clears throat> the physics of the matter um and in fact if i take that chart um one step further <clears throat> and put some numbers on it 
so one thing is well that's energy efficiency but that's not really what what customers are interested in is, is, is costs um and so i looked at costs so this is now these will vary enormously retail electricity costs um in some countries that will look remarkably cheap if you're in, in denmark or germany that will look, that will look remarkably cheap and um, that's the average figure um or was the average figure in the states uh, in february this year um it varies enormously even in the states so hawaii would be about three times that i think uh, there'll be other states that are lower than that <coughs> so so that's going to vary depending where you are um if you've got <coughs> so that's but that's so retail electricity is what you buy at your charger basically <coughs> so we'll forget about all this stuff um <coughs> it being produced in the grid doesn't matter what it costs in the grid as a customer and how much losses there are there what you want what you're interested in is how much you pay when it arrives at your your house uh, and then you've got losses along the way which means effectively at the wheel um <coughs> the cost is the cost is higher and then what i did was i kind of worked backwards <coughs> and say okay well, we want hydrogen to be a similar effect at the wheel so i'll start with that number um i'm going to use these losses in here um, and i end up that my target now my target price for hydrogen has to be this has to be seven cents per kilowatt hour and maybe again if we make our energy losses a bit less here <coughs> um, i can make it slightly higher but it's going to be marginal and i can turn that into a cost of hydrogen this is at the um this is cost of hydrogen for the customer uh, is around three dollars per kilogram now the reality if you go to a filling station in california or somewhere is that you're going to pay more like ten dollars per kilogram probably even more than that so so again from a cost point of view we're also we're also miles away in terms of um cost of of running these things so so that's that's a challenge um that's very difficult to come up with any kind of argument around fuel around energy efficiency of the, of the kind of end-to-end -end cycle and then how that runs through in terms of cost um <clears throat> cost of fuel per kilowatt at the wheel um, which makes hydrogen look better than um than battery so the question obviously and the conclusion of many people therefore is that well why why bother um why are we why are we going down this this hydrogen route um and so one answer to that and the answer that comes up most frequently is well that's that's maybe true if we're talking about smaller vehicles but where hydrogen does have a an advantage is when we think about weight um so i kind of did my best kind of looking around at, at various numbers um so these might not be exactly right but i think they're they, they should be pretty close um to illustrate the point so that here's two <coughs> two car two electric cars remember these are all electric cars they're just different ways of producing electricity so we've got a tesla model s and we've got a toyota mirai um I, again are they exactly the same size and exactly the same car <coughs> equivalent well we can argue about that but anyway the point is so in the tesla model s the battery weighs <coughs> just over half a ton um and it gets you and because it's a big battery and uh, and teslas are pretty efficient um it gets you a pretty good range <laughs> and your total car ends up <coughs> at just over two tons now that's 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 heavy for a car um <coughs> certainly compared to a an equivalent um internal combustion engine car i mean i i again i came up with a kind of random example at the bottom um <coughs> two liter five series uh weighs quite a bit less um, and gets a lot more range um, i think you'd have to drive it pretty carefully to get that range but anyway that's the official mileage figures as all these ranges these are official ranges given by the manufacturers so let's kind of within the the obvious issues around whether tests are accurate let's kind of take their word for it um so what i did was i said okay well if you want to for example scale up a battery car to now do a thousand kilometers um, how much would that weigh and if you're, if you're talking about battery then really to scale up to more range you need more battery um, and if if 544 kilograms of battery gets you 426 kilometers then you need the same again plus a bit more 
um, to add on that extra range. And so suddenly your Tesla with a thousand kilometer range um, starts to weigh even more. <laughs> Again, I'm, what I've done there is I've simply scaling, if you like, the energy storage part of this. Um, if you start to have a two and a half, two point eight ton vehicle rather than a two ton vehicle, you'd also have to scale up things like suspension weight and chassis weight and all, all sorts of other bits and pieces. So there's there's other other things that come into play. But I'm, again, this is just illustrative. If you look at a Toyota Mirai, now the total weight of a Toyota Mirai is is still pretty heavy. It's not a it's not a kind of it's not a Lotus Elise. It's not <clears throat> you're not going to be um doing much racing in it um it has a but it's it weighs less than a tesla and it has a, a longer range which hydrogen people will be cheering at so that's good um but what's more interesting in terms of weight and scale up is where that weight accrues from so the fuel cell weighs around 50 kilos but the energy storage, the equivalent, if you like, from the battery is the energy storage bit. It's the hydrogen tanks. Now, the actual weight of hydrogen in a Toyota Mirai, the, the capacity is five kilograms. That's how much, that's the maximum um, capacity it can store in terms of weight of hydrogen. It can store it at high pressure. Um, and so that gives you this energy content and you can see therefore why the range is a bit higher. Now, you've got much more energy content, but you're converting it less efficiently, less efficiently because you're going through a fuel cell rather than a motor, rather than through a battery. Um, but you end up with a slightly higher range. Um, there's also a battery. The, the key thing to remember about hydrogen cars is they all have batteries in. They're not. So this, this idea that they're battery free isn't true. They have a battery that um, actually the battery drives the wheels. The hydrogen, um, the, the fuel cell produces electricity to go into the battery and the battery then drives the wheels that's because the battery is more responsive um, to acceleration deceleration um, you can have a higher specific power output um, and also it allows you to do things like regenerative braking so you can you can put energy back into a battery um, as you as you slow the car down um, but what we'd like to know now is okay to get a thousand kilometers out of this car um, if I can go 500, I basically need double the amount of storage. So I need, so the bit I'm doubling now is my 87 kilograms. So in theory, I could, I could have a much higher range with a much smaller penalty in weight. So the, the point I'm trying to make there is that if you start adding range and, and the, it's range here, but it could be, it's just how it's just energy usage really it could be going a short distance but with an enormously heavy load for example which would use more energy the point here is that to store more energy with hydrogen that the weight of the hydrogen is kind of neither here nor there because it's very light gas um but it's it's how do this how do the tanks that you're storing it in uh, how do they scale in terms of weight compared to scaling a battery and so this is the kind of argument for <coughs> This is really a kind of illustration. I'm using using cars, um, but this is an illustration for okay. How does hydrogen scale in terms of heavy vehicles? Um, why does it potentially make more sense in heavy vehicles? Because the efficient we've still got the same problem in terms of that efficiency um, efficiency. Uh, what do you call it? Efficiency waterfall. I'm trying to think of the right term, but end to end efficiency kind of chain. Um, but from a practical point of view, the you're also weight is obviously going to be an issue because the, the more something weighs, the more energy you need to move it. So, so there's going to be a trade off between energy efficiency, but adding lots more weight, because if you add a vast amount more weight, even if you're more energy efficient, you'll still end up using more energy we got there in the end. So that's the kind of the rationale um, between the two. And so that then gets us on to weight potentially matters and so that gets us into the different segments of the transport cars it's going to be it's very difficult because um when you add up all the other bits and pieces in there um there's a bit of a weight advantage but not actually a huge amount um, to go for and then it and then unless you think that that kind of range is not not sufficient and for some people it might not be but i would suggest that for the vast majority of people um when it comes to a choice of can I go another 70 or 80 kilometers but I have to pay two or three times as much for my fuel 
uh, I suspect most people will say, well, actually, I'll <laughs> I'll accept a slightly lower range. So, but people will choose. It'll be consumer choice. There might be there might be some that <clears throat> choose the higher range, but they'll have to be prepared to spend more money to do it. <clears throat> I'll just check if there's any questions on that because that's been clear. Um, <clears throat> Okay, but for the battery electric vehicle, network infrastructure needs, needs serious upgrades for high penetration of electric vehicles. <coughs> um, a full fuel cell <coughs> may have an advantage here under high penetration. The problem, the problem I see with that argument is that <coughs> for battery electric vehicles, the network infrastructure exists. Um, <coughs> you can you can plug in at home. If you've got a good connection, you can charge your electric vehicle. You might not be able to charge it very quickly, but then if you're at home and it's parked for 12 hours overnight, you don't care. Um, that's one of the things that owners of electric vehicles like is the fact they never have to visit a fuel station again and they're in control of their own electricity costs. They can even choose when to charge it. Um, if you scale it up, um, yes, potentially you do need um, a significant ele <coughs> um, electricity network upgrades, but then the question is whether so these questions keep disappearing for some reason. Um, the question is to whether that is is impossible. Um, I would suggest the answer is, is no. Um, there are plenty of, there's been plenty of distribution companies looking at the impact it's going to have on the distribution network. And until you get to very, to quite high penetrations, actually the answers are they can, they can deal with a lot of it through things like smart charging. Uh, through things like combining it with storage um, so that the time shifting element is going to be going to be key it's really at peak times that it becomes a problem um, so if you can encourage people to charge at different times if you can as well as having home charging if more workplace workplaces have charging and so on actually I, I think people overestimate some of the um, the grid issues that that arise um, but in the short run the simple answer the, the flip side of that is that at least there is a an infrastructure there. Um, we've seen how slowly hydrogen fuel networks have rolled out in various countries. Um, you have to build that network from scratch. Um, so, so I think I, I, again, it's not to say that in future, um, if you if you could leap forward thirty years and say, okay, what would work out to have been the cheapest thing to do? Um, maybe if you were if we were starting from a blank piece of paper um you you'd say well the hydrogen infrastructure is easier or cheaper but again remember it's got to offset from the customer point of view it's got to offset cost um if it's more expensive to run this the infrastructure would have to be substantially cheaper um and also um just from a practical point of view you've got to deploy it in the first place um and i'm sorry there might have been more of that question but it seems it's vanished off my screen for some reason um the q a thing has gone a bit weird um um other yeah i mean the other there's the other things that always crop up um environmental factors impact of batteries lithium mining battery recycling and so on again yeah they're all they're all issues um the fact is there is there's no aspect of clean energy that's not going to come without an environmental impact um if you building wind farms solar farms whatever it may be the hydrogen cars there's going to be an environmental impact. There's going to be increases in mining and so on. Um, again, some of them, I think some of them are overblown. Um, so lithium mining, for example, one of people worried about lithium supply. The fact is with almost any historical commodity you, you look at in the past, um, lithium is not a rare element in the grand scheme of things. It's something like the 13th most 13th, I can't remember the exact number, but it's not a rare earth element. There's, there's actually a lot of it about. The reason there's not much, there's not been much supply about is we've not really needed it, we've not used it. Um, so lithium will be is available. Um, lithium, lithium supply is increasing. Um, it may not, it, in the short run, it may not keep up with demand. Um, in terms of there's things about cobalt. That's that's been quite controversial. I mean, in actual fact, a lot of that. That's not that. That's actually not around electric cars. I mean, the stuff about cobalt mining in the Congo has arisen because of mobile phones and laptops. So um, you need to be slightly careful about what the um, where that's arisen. Um, the other the other issue is that already 
there are already car companies that use batteries that don't use cobalt so you can you can get rid of it and also that's a, it's a supply chain issue it's not it's an important issue but there's no reason why you have to accept um poor mining practices or um <clears throat> environmentally damaging um practices uh, battery recycling will happen that's just a it's happening already um in china and south korea there's quite a lot of lithium ion battery recycling um so i think yes these are these are issues and then many of them are issues in the short run but i think if you're trying to base i'd be very wary of basing using those as reasons why electric battery electric cars aren't going to move forwards because none of them battery recycling is not an insurmountable problem it's an economic if there's if it's um if it's cheaper to recycle the materials or more economic to recycle or you're told that by regulators that you have to recycle the materials then you'll do that rather than um rather than get them um, as as new material so so yeah and and there are also issues i mean you could start talking about platinum in hydrogen fuel cells um you could you'd have to look at the environmental footprint of hydrogen is it realistically going to all be green hydrogen or is it coming from gray hydrogen so whatever side we look at we could identify environmental factors but it'll be part of the argument um but i would be slightly wary of um over egging how <coughs> how big a part of the argument it might be. Um, Alan, it would be interesting to do a similar analysis comparing mass scale batteries in solar wind projects versus hydrogen production in numbers, which might be profitable to store energy or to produce hydrogen and sell it to off takers. Again, the challenge you have, whether it's, I mean, this is storage effectively. Um, it's energy storage. It's just energy storage in a mobile thing, in a, in a vehicle that moves rather than a stationary battery you still have the same you still have those same issues around efficiency i mean the, the the nub of it is that a battery putting electricity into a battery and getting electricity out of the battery the round trip efficiency is very high at a cell level it's kind of 95 percent at a battery system level it's probably kind of 85 90 percent um whereas with the best will in the world a hydrogen from a hydrogen round trip efficiency point of view the electrolyzer is, is not going to be more than 80% efficient. And then, so that's the production of hydrogen. And then even if you ignore storage of hydrogen, so, so things like compression, energy use for compression, for example, um, which you couldn't really ignore. It's probably, you, probably another 10 or 20%. But then when, to get the electricity back out, you're not going to be above 60%, you're probably going to be 50%. So that round trip efficiency um, is very hard to compete with. Now, it's not impossible to compete with. What If you're going to have poor round trip efficiency, what you need to have is some other ad cost advantage. So the cost of the system has to be less, <coughs> has to be substantially, if you're substantially worse on round trip efficiency, then the cost of the system has to be substantially less to offset that. Um, and and it's the same argument it's around scale if you're if you're doing it on a small scale and in stationary storage nowadays i would suggest that means a few, up to several hours it's it's hard to do because the cost of batteries has come down so quickly um but if you're doing it of a long duration it's the same issue it's like having long duration is equivalent of long range um if you start stacking up more and more batteries in their shipping containers to store for 15 hours or 20 hours or three days or a week um the economics of that start to become a lot less favorable compared to some of the hydrogen storage options so for example storing storing hydrogen in a in a salt cavern underground which people are, are looking at it's very it's um you need to have the right location um there'll be some there'll be some cost to set that up but if you look at the cost per kilowatt hour that you store when you go to very large scale then that starts to offset the cost of stacking up 10,000 batteries to to store for um several days so it's it's sort of the same it's the same analysis you could do the same analysis um relatively straightforwardly i would have thought in fact maybe i'll maybe i'll do it one day and, and post it up um Comparing a hydrogen station to a normal petrol station for 10 cars, how much would it cost? Technically, what is needed um, to install a hydrogen station for cars or trucks? How to get the hydrogen there? 
who will pay for those investments? So, so there's lots of questions all in there. Um, hydrogen stations, they're expensive. I don't know what the cost comparison is off the top of my head. I'd have to go and, and look at that. But I mean, uh, <clears throat> I've seen people talking about hydrogen stations costing a, a few million dollars. <clears throat> um, I doubt it costs anything like that for a normal petrol station. Um, the difficulties you have, so petrol, um, you store as a liquid in a tank. Hydrogen, you're going to have to store in compressed um, either compressed or liquefied format for any sensible volume. So that's going to add on cost. Um, there's going to be health and safety issues, planning issues around that as well. Um, <clears throat> to get the hydrogen there, um, currently in, in markets where there are hydrogen stations, that it's it's got there by truck. It's pipe. Um, it's um, the trailer trucks with the the um the tubes tube trailers uh, with pipes of um tubes of compressed hydrogen on them um if you were going to big scale potentially with a hydrogen network but i would suggest again that's where things like um producing it on site electrolysis on site um becomes potentially uh, more more useful to to get rid of it, to get around that issue um and who will pay for those investments? Well, that's the that's the classic question, private or public. Um, it's hard to see. I would suggest it's hard to see why governments would, given the the scale already and the head start that battery vehicles have and some of the arguments about efficiency and so on, why the governments would suddenly say, oh, oh yeah, we'll we'll start paying for hydrogen, um, <clears throat> hydrogen fuel cell. Um, networks so i think it's probably going to be private there's some interest where it becomes interesting um is and where it it could it can start to happen i would suggest and we're kind of going to lead on to this is that you might start to create hydrogen stations based on trucks because from the weight scale side of things that we've mentioned they make the most immediate sense or they've got the most competitive advantage um, but if you create a hydrogen fuel station and you pay for that but the infrastructure and the business case is based on providing fuel for trucks um, you can help that business case if you then allow private vehicles to use them and I think one of the examples I've got coming up in fact on the next slide um, which is this one um, the one on the right which is Hyundai um, in Switzerland setting up, uh, which was, I think, about the biggest um, actual sort of reasonably solid um, project in terms of scale. Um, there were some more kind of notional ones, um, but in terms of rollout, what they're looking at doing is they are looking at heavy trucks hauling groceries around, um, so the weight, that's where the weight becomes an advantage. And if you want a decent range, um, they are, they're building filling stations and it gives you a cost of a filling station there. Um, now they actually don't need that many trucks because trucks use a lot of hydrogen each time they fill up to make those profitable. But what they're also, also looking at doing potentially is making those available um, to, to private cars as well. I've, and I've seen a number of projects where they're looking at, they're basically building the business case based on trucking and paying for those investments through that, through that case. And then um, once, but once they're open, there's no reason why you then can open those up for cars. But in the short run, there's no case really for cars. There's not enough cars. There's not enough hydrogen cars on the road. You've got the classic chicken and egg who's going to build the stations if there's no cars, who's going to buy the cars if there's no stations. So you need something to break that cycle. And, and I think many people believe that what will break that cycle, if, if indeed we ever end up with sizable numbers of hydrogen cars, is you actually start with heavy, um, heavy transport segments for which um, you build, you can build those stations and make a case for those. And then once they're, once they're there, then you've got the infrastructure there you can open it up to, to private cars as well um sebastian as mentioned is the best trade-off a hybrid vehicle um yeah i mean i've made, i've raised that point um in various places in the past um we have plug-in hybrids now which are hybrids of battery vehicles um 
which are much more efficient for if you're just kind of trundling around short distances you don't need the range and so on you so you get the energy efficiency advantage but if you're concerned about range you or <coughs> you you've got the um or or usage could be range could be weight you've got the backup of a um and currently a petrol engine um i i don't see any reason in future why you couldn't combine a battery with hydrogen as i say all hydrogen vehicles have a battery so you could play around with the the ratio of the energy storage that's hydrogen versus battery um and optimize it for the um the usage that that we're talking about so so yeah i mean i i would i would tend to think I mean, hybrid vehicles are more, there's more complexity compared to just one or the other, I guess. Um, but there are certainly some advantages in, um, in being able to do that. Um, I think I mentioned yesterday the one of the problems with using gas distribution systems for hydrogen, getting hydrogen to filling stations, is that you need to separate out the hydrogen um, at, at the filling station. So you need gas separation systems, which are, are not cheap and not, um, uh, and add quite a lot of cost. Um, will energy losses along the efficiency be reduced? Um, possibly. Um, I think the uh, fuel cell efficiencies they might creep up. I would suggest. I think I mentioned. I think I mentioned this yesterday with electrolysis. Same for fuel cells. Most of the focus in the short run, I would suggest, is going to be around reducing costs rather than necessarily greatly increasing performance. I think there are some theoretical limits to how efficient um, fuel cells can be. Um, same with electrolysis. So I think there will be there will be sort of incremental um, benefits in increases in, um, in efficiency, reduction in losses. Um, yes, through through manufacturing and just through optimization through technology progress, really. Um, but I don't think from a, it will be more cost. It will be more the cost um, comparison will start to close rather than the um, efficiency comparison. Um, and Peter's asked about, could I explain what happened to hydrogen economy plans in Iceland 20 years ago? Um, <clears throat> probably not. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be an expert in what Iceland had planned. Um, <clears throat> but we can certainly at the end I was going to there's some sum up slides at the end where we can maybe think about, well, I think one of the quiz question, the poll questions yesterday was we've seen it all before. Is it all going to fade away again? And, they, and nobody said yes. Um, but yeah, that's there's that kind of there's that issue that comes up again. Um, anyway, um, so trucks, heavy. So the obvious thing from light transport is to go towards heavy trucks. Um, <coughs> Again, I, I don't need to read that side. I've mentioned the Hyundai example. Nikola, I've mentioned a couple of times. Um, the factors, really, there are, 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 it's worth pointing out a few of these factors. Whoops. Um, we've talked about range and speed. There's obviously one weight we've mentioned. Um, things like, but things that may not have come up, auxiliary loads. Um, actually, that comes up on the next slide. Um, things like air conditioning in hot countries, for example, um, where air conditioning is on a lot of the time in the vehicle and is working a lot harder that uses energy um and so if you're if, if you're relying on your battery that cuts got to come out of the battery rather than the um if you're using hydrogen it's coming out of your your hydrogen capacity so it's so when you when we think about range i would tend to translate range not just into kilometers but i would think about range in terms of energy usage so it's that's <laughs> So it's it's the range you go, it's how fast you go, and it's how heavy you are. Those all combine to decide how much energy you're going to use. That's really the key here, because a battery is a way of storing energy, and a composite cylinder storing compressed hydrogen is a way of storing energy. So it's it's the rate at which we use energy that's going to be the issue. And so auxiliary loads come into that. Um, one of the issues of range that has come that has come up is and this idea that well we could go we could go a thousand kilometers in one go in our hydrogen vehicle whereas we can't do that in our in our in our battery truck is actually you may not be allowed to do that anyway um there are many countries have quite strict driving time regulations which determine that after you've been driving for a certain number of hours you've got to take a certain number of hours off anyway in which case your battery truck could be charging so again you've got to be slightly careful about transferring some of the kind of <clears throat> big 
sort of claims as to what they mean in practice. Um, it's all very well being able to drive a thousand kilometers, taking 15 hours to do it. But if you're not allowed to do that, then there's no point in, in needing to have a range of, of a thousand kilometers. So, so again, think there'll be those kind of practical issues. It's not all about thermodynamics and, and energy and so on. And ultimately total cost of ownership. What's interesting with both these examples is that they are, again, they're taking the risk out of the um, hydrogen side of it um, because they are their leases they're using what they call all in so the the deals that companies are signing um, to take these these truck fleets uh, is not just to take the truck but it's the hydrogen cost is included within it so they're not they're not they're de-risking the the customer in terms of the cost of hydrogen um, and they're using and in doing that so they're, they're taking a risk obviously on that but they are by signing long um, long leases, which give companies known total cost of ownership, they, it also means they've got a steady revenue stream and they can use that then to provide the money to build out the filling stations. That's kind of the business model and how it works um, and doing it over time. And then I'm aware we need a break, um, but while we're on the road, um, the same principles apply to buses. And so you, you're starting to see that there are lots of battery buses around, but you're starting to see interest in um, in hydrogen buses as well. Back to the hybrid thing, this one was interesting recently, uh, this announcement, which was, um, it's a switch all battery bus fleet. So they've got 7,000 um, battery buses in China. Um, they're not getting rid, of the, but it's hybridization. They're basically, they're basically putting exactly what we talked about, hydrogen fuel extenders um, onto these buses to um for for whatever reason they i don't know <coughs> in, they've been operating these as battery buses for some time so they've obviously decided that um given the usage um given some of the the challenges on <coughs> on energy usage range and so on that going forwards or maybe they want to extend where they drive to extend the ability of those buses they're looking at not switching to hydrogen but switching to battery hydrogen hybrid um, and again, there's some other examples there of um, of <coughs> of using um, using hydrogen buses. Uh, again, this is the hot environments. So that's the auxiliary load, <coughs> the advantage of, um, of using hydrogen. And again, not one or the other. This this is based on a on an EV platform, <coughs> so it's based on a battery an existing battery bus platform. They're basically swapping. They're providing they're providing customers with an option. They're saying, okay, some customers will be perfectly happy with battery because they're going short distances, low speeds, trundling around on steady routes where they can charge, um, they can <coughs> they can charge up when they stop um, or they can charge up overnight or whatever else and that's absolutely fine. But there'll be other customers who need, have more energy requirement and that might be about range, it might be about capacity of passengers. And as I said here, it might be around auxiliary loads like air conditioning for whom fuel cells make more sense. Um, again, we mentioned about private cars using infrastructure again, this one at the bottom. So, so as, I mean, as I said yesterday, it's um, within transport, as within other sectors, you can't just segment light vehicles, heavy vehicles, or any other vehicles into just that's it. You've got heavy vehicles. Within heavy vehicles, you've got heavy vehicles that go a long way, <coughs> that go very quickly. You've got some that go very slowly and trundle around on sh short routes um, that stop regularly and can charge when they stop. There are examples of, of doing that. And so that's why you've got a different, some customers will be fine with battery and it may be cheaper for them to do that. There'll be other customers for whom there's a real opportunity um, for, for hydrogen. Um, and there'll be some cost customers for whom actually um, hybridizing the two makes the most sense. Uh, just before we have a break, um, Sebastian, do you think that cities policies banning diesel engine vehicles could boost development of hydrogen trucks, vans? Uh, yes, there's a short answer. Um, diesel, particularly in the heavy vehicle sector, diesel is, is basically what um, what's what drives it literally. Um, and so, yeah, if you're if you're going to ban diesel then that opens up um opens up a competitive playing field to, to replace it and some of it will be replaced with battery there are um there are plenty of companies um doing doing battery electric vehicles for for delivery vans and so on um 
and, and they're, all, they're all battery powered garbage trucks and so on, but there will be other companies that will <clears throat> decide that hydrogen gives them a better option for that. And, and again, they'll be looking at not just the upfront cost and the energy efficiency and the fuel cost, but they'll be looking at total cost of ownership. How long do these, how long do the vehicles last? <clears throat> um, how much other infrastructure do they have to set up and, and so on. So, and Daryl has given an example, four electric Scania trucks are being in operations in Trondheim, first of a kind grocery wholesaler. So yeah, it's an example of a hydrogen storage system. Hydrogen, lightweight hydrogen storage system weighs in at 33 kilograms. That's pretty tiny. Uh, provides the trucks with 400 to 500 kilometers range uh, using a single fuel cell power module. Yeah. You're seeing increasing examples of um, of of hydrogen vehicles of, of various types. Again, we'll after the break we'll come back to um, some of the other bits of transport. So, so yeah, watch watch this space. Um, okay, I think at that point, before we move on to rail. I make it again. We'll do the my, by my standard time. I'm making it just after two forty-five. So let's let's make the numbers simple and say we'll whoops we'll come back at uh, three three p.m. UK four p.m. Uh, Euro and whatever in in Calgary. <laughs> okay, so yeah, a little bit longer. So just over 10 minutes and then we'll come back. As I say, if in the meantime, if you want to throw some more questions up in the um, Q&A box, then then feel free um, and we'll, we'll carry on from there. Okay, see you shortly.
Okay, I'm going to make the assumption that people are generally back. Hey, John, I was just going to jump in quickly. Someone did okay. mention um, in the q and I know um, when you do see the questions come up, um, if you, the thumb that's underneath them, when people click on that, it kind of upvotes. So the questions, they don't get removed. They actually move to the very top of the um, the page. So, John, as well, if you just double check, scroll up through the questions. Some, some yeah, questions no, have I, upvoted them, that's all. I worked out once. That's why they were disappearing. So. Oh, perfect. So, yeah, no, I did, didn't want to interrupt. But <laughs> Yeah. No, it, so in, in some ways, it's actually it's easier for me if you don't upvote them. I mean, I'll try and answer them all rather than look at which of got votes um so it just means they keep in the same order but anyway i'll i'll flip the buttons and forwards a bit in future thanks um so just to make this a truly interactive um presentation um this is a document which has kindly been emailed to me um by daryl of um proton power so I thought I'd flick it up. It kind of illustrates some of the stuff we were we were talking about, really. So I thought I'd show it. But I'm not going to spend up hours talking about it. I'll scroll through it, and then you'll have it on the video, and you can pause it and look at the figures in more detail if you wish. Um, but I mean, effectively, there are some there are some obvious points. I don't know whether in Word I can draw with my pen. I might be able to. Um, but wait, oh, I can. It's, it's black rather than, than red. So this is payload and energy density, the point they're making here. We've got diesel, so current, we've got hydrogen, and we've got battery. So this kind of just makes my point about weight. Um, if you start adding, if you want to do very heavy trucking, um, what they call class eight trucks with battery, it starts to become extremely uh, weighty. And if your battery weighs a lot, then it means you can carry less payload. So that's the issue here, is that you're using up a whole bunch of the... Um, the stuff you could be carrying and selling, your bananas or whatever, um, you're using it with weight of battery. So now you'll notice that both hydrogen and um, and the hydrogen also takes a chunk away from, from diesel. So that kind of makes the point about weight, uh, sort of illustrates what, we, what we'd mentioned. Um, if I quickly scroll down, um, productivity, again, that's just around charging time and so on. I'm not going, to, not going to dwell on that. Obviously, it takes longer to charge a battery than to fill a truck with fuel. Um, I guess this, the last one is a bit a bit scary for both, actually, um, if I've read these correctly. Um, so <clears throat> diesel again over here. Oh, it's gone green now. That's very odd. Um, diesel here, compressed hydrogen uh, battery. Um, <clears throat> they cost a lot more the upfront cost of these things is, is enormous and hydrogen trucks uh, certainly cost more upfront than, than battery trucks um, with hydrogen the fuel cost also is tending to kill it um i think daryl pointed out that costs in california currently are more like sort of 12 to 14 dollars per kilogram <clears throat> that's a delivered cost again that's miles away from what all this argument about production cost so if you're a customer if your production, you, you don't care either way whether the production cost is $1 or $3. If you're paying $12, then that's what you're interested in. Um, so we have to think about where those costs accrue. Um, the, but on both of them, I mean, this so 350 miles per day, 300 days, $63,000. I mean, they're both, <clears throat> there's quite a big number there. Um, so, so, yeah. I'll leave you to peruse those slides as you wish, and I'm presuming on the network, Daryl will be quite happy to um, <coughs> discuss in more detail if you want to as well. Okay, um, let me just go back to where we were. Okay, so back on <coughs> other heavy transport, um, rail, there's quite a bit going on in rail. Again, you've got to look at these projects as kind of early stage. A lot of them are kind of demo. Uh, this one, I mean, this is says it's just a recent headline was first tested in the Netherlands. It's been running in Germany for uh, a while, and in fact, eighteen months ago, and in fact, just the other day, um, they ordered a bunch more. Um, there was some there was some data, um, some information came out about about these Alstom hydrogen trains running in Germany. They've been very reliable. They've worked. Uh, again, 
<clears throat> these are the can numbers. Um, if you want to go further and faster, you can't do that with battery. We urban <clears throat> urban rail, but um, there are battery drains for urban rail. They make a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> It, again, if you can't electrify using an overhead line, of course, um, but if you're in a place where you've not got overhead lines to electrify, uh, the cost of building those is prohibitive. I know in the UK there's some practical issues, like if you uh, if you had to make room for the gantries for the overhead lines, you'd have to start dropping the level of the track because the bridges are too low. So again, the civil works involved in that would just be insane. Um, so if you if you can't electrify the lines and you need to go quicker and further than you can with a battery, then hydrogen starts to come into play. Um, again, what's interesting, I, I think here is um, as well as the application is is the the business model side of it. So long, I mean that's a long time uh, a maintenance and energy supply contract. So. Um, if you're a customer, if you're a rail rail operator um you'll probably when people talk about hydrogen and hydrogen filling and <clears throat> what the cost could be you're at, certainly at this stage you're not going to want to take the risk in the long and for a unit that's going to run for 25 30 years you don't want to be worrying about what your source of hydrogen is going to be what the cost of hydrogen is going to be going forwards um you want that to be de-risked you want that to fall back on the um on the provider so <clears throat> so energy supply you're finding that in a lot of these contracts both the trucks trains other things with hydrogen is that to take that worry away from the customer the provider actually um, takes on those contracts now in return obviously for taking on that risk what they're rewarded with is a nice long term almost kind of like leasing um, contract so a nice revenue stream it's a bit like if I'm a renewable power project provider having a nice long 20-year feed-in tariff I know I know my income and then it's just up to me to make sure that my my costs um, fall fall below that um, so there's a few of these again much a much smaller project um, here in here in California so again with with rail it's very much about I said range and speed again think energy um, think and you might think hot country versus cold country again, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're talking about freight rail, again, you'd think about how much they're carrying. Um, but in, in, in particular, an issue with rail is as a way to electrify without having the fully overhead gantry stuff um, in place. Um, marine, again, early early days. There are um, there are some some drivers, and um, this one's quite an interesting one in Norway. Um, vessels powered by hydrocarbon will be banned from 2026. I didn't realise that until recently, but apparently that's the case. Um, so if you're if you're a um, company running vessels in those in those places, then you've got you've got a reason you have to have to um, think about it. So there are already battery powered um, ships running in Norwegian fjords um, on short <coughs> short hops to and to and from. Um, because short distance, low speed, you can charge each time you stop at each end. It works perfectly well. Um, but if you want to go further and you want to go faster, then um, you're looking at other alternatives. One of which is is potentially hydrogen. Now, this, I mean, it's interesting. They talk about liquid hydrogen. Um, so we're talking about um, low temperature, um, low temperature storage, but liquid rather than than compressed hydrogen. Um, and again, here they're talking about um, fuel cell, so, so it's effectively an electric power drivetrain for the vessel fuel cell rather than combustion of hydrogen. Um, they, and as I say, they've also got um, also looking at um, other types of vessel as well. So <clears throat> there have been lots of studies around um, around shipping looking at the the possibility of it i mean this was quite an interesting one that i picked out um 99 of trans-pacific um voyages could have been powered by fuel cells however um quite a bit of them would mean back to a bit like our picture with the truck um because of change because the fuel is less energy dense than um conventional conventional fuel you need more space you'd lose some of your cargo space you'd have to look at the economics of that um and and again just over half you'd also need an additional port of call which would obviously add um cost to the to the journey um to the the economics of that trip um, but there's certainly plenty of scope 
Uh, I mentioned, we mentioned about ammonia powered vessels, in this case, fuel cell. Um, <clears throat> World first. I see lots of headlines with world first. So if someone has a <laughs> claims that one's already in existence, I'm not going to argue. Um, but it seems it's the kind of it seems to be a, a requirement of headline writers these days to call it world first. Um, again, time scales important. Late 2023 they're looking at, and and it's not again EU funding. So we're not talking about having a fully commercial business case at, at this stage. So, but same principle um, as with other, other modes of transport, you've got to look at the usage, uh, particularly at energy, energy requirements, speed, weight, range. Um, and it's not going to be one size fits all. You're going to have battery electric ships. You're going to have hydrogen fuel cell ships. Um, and additionally, I guess in shipping, um, <coughs> shipping also potentially is transporting hydrogen so that's where some of the ammonia stuff potentially gets interesting um or even liquid hydrogen gets interesting you might have the payload of the ship itself could be hydrogen if, if we get to a stage where we're doing big scale exports and and you use a portion of that payload to actually power the boat as well um okay and then i guess if we're going to so, sorry, that's just making the point about um, coexistence. I'm, as you probably gathered, um, I try not to fall into camps of it has to be one or the other. I'm, I'm a kind of, I'm a firm believer that um, one size doesn't fit all. Different customers will have different needs, um, and so you'll have you'll have these things coexisting. Again, another Norwegian company. They already run some battery vessels, um, but they've now signed contract for hydrogen. Um, Alstom, we mentioned hydrogen trains, they also run, they've also got battery trains as well. It's it's having different options for different different customers. Uh, and Nicola, the um, started, they launched a few years ago as a hydrogen trucking company. They actually already have, um, they've also got within their product range, um, battery um, trucks. And also they, as anyone in the Certainly, North America seems to have to be able to do. You have to be able to launch a what? Well, what? What you call a truck? Um, what I'd call a pickup truck. Um, it seems <coughs> obviously a big, a big, um, a big customer demand for those. Um, and they've launched a again, or at least on a concept level, a hybrid. So not just battery. I guess trying to compete with the with the Tesla. Um, Tesla One um, hybrid between fuel cell hydrogen and and electric. So, and then I guess the the final the the ultimate frontier, if you like, in in tricky to decarbonize transport is aviation. Um, and there are things there are things going on in aviation. I've picked out a couple of examples here of um, of companies that are looking at planes and have prototypes. Have um, I've tested prototypes and have um, concepts in development um, and have timescales over which they're claiming that they're going to launch. So 2022, their prototype before 2025. Again, um, you've got to obviously treat those with a little bit of caution, but that's that's the kind of thing they're talking about. They're both we're not talking about jumbo jets here. They're both talking about small, uh, relatively small planes, um, a few seats. Uh, but relatively long distances as well and again i did not i didn't um dig out the data here but you can look again at the aviation sector and you can segment um, and you actually find an awful lot of aviation is over quite short distances and a lot of the big rise in aviation usage has been the short haul the a lot of particularly the budget airlines um so within europe within asia um, and elsewhere these kind of short hop um airline usage so so there's, again, you can need to segment between that, between small planes, between big planes, between transatlantic planes and so on. If, if you're going to get to the really big stuff, if we want to fly jumbos from London to Singapore, um, then it's going to be tricky to do with, with hydrogen fuel, even, even liquefied um, for highest energy density. Um, so then we're back into this idea of synthetic fuels. And so there are, there are companies, this is one um, based in the Netherlands, already looking at things like synthetic fuel manufacture from um, green hydrogen. Um, I'm, again, I'm slightly skeptical. I'm interested to see 
uh, if this comes to comes to fruition. Um, the quote was the main problem is the cost. That that's kind of Normally, that would be kind of British understatement. That's obviously Dutch understatement. It's going to be very expensive. There was a there was a company um, here in the UK that had a, a deal with uh, British Airways to produce synthetic fuels from um, waste, <laughs> municipal waste, um, using gasification. So they would gasify the waste, produce hydrogen, um, use that to produce synthetic fuel. But with the low oil prices um, and and frankly a bit of lack of <clears throat> kind of real urgent pressure on airlines to um to pursue it um that that, that disappeared that went out of business so <clears throat> so again some of these things may or may not happen but it's worth pointing out that in in aviation there are there are people um there are people playing around with hydrogen in, in aviation I, i'd suggest further away i mean at smaller scale you could break aviation down into if you look at things like drones there are already fuel cell drones um companies selling those um and who's again you've got to look at well, what's the future of age aviation um there's passenger aviation but given what's just happened is passenger aviation going to um going to come back is it going to come back as strongly as it did is it going to carry on growing as it did um are are we going to have more very short run aviation are we going to have automated um autonomous drone aviation is amazon going to be delivering stuff to your door using a hydrogen fuel cell powered drone so i mean there's there's all sorts of all sorts of options here um but again it's i would suggest we look at kind of look at the future certainly and plan for that um but also look at um it's also obviously important if we're going to get any of this off, stuff off the ground to look at the stuff that's happening more immediately uh, Sebastian asked, don't you think that LNG shipping is competing with hydrogen in these cases? Um, yes, I would think is the answer, but obviously liquefied natural gas, um, you don't have the um, the problem there is the is carbon, um, carbon emissions. So, so again, we're back to uh, if the world suddenly decides well, we're not bothered about carbon, then you could argue none of this will go forward. Um, but even even in the absence of back to my issue about actual policy versus inferred policy or um, prospective future policy, I would I would suggest that um, in future the the direction of travel in more and more more and more places is that um, decarbonisation is going to be going to be more and more um, required of more and more sectors. <coughs> Um, now that will so that will come with a cost. It's it's not going to be it's not going to be a free switch, um, but but if you're in the market if you're in markets like hydrogen, then then that's going to be one of the things that drives it. If there's no driver, if there's no need to do that, then yes, you're um, you're going to have problems competing. Okay, um, I better crack on. So, heat and power. Um, probably talked about a reasonable amount of this I guess heat particularly um, is is seen as depending where you are potentially a big market for hydrogen obviously if you're in in somewhere where heat is not a very big market then then perhaps less so um, but in markets in particularly northern hemisphere northern Europe northern uh, north of North America um, and Europe and so on uh, north of China <coughs> Uh, heating is is a big deal and it's a big demand. This chart shows the um, demand in, in energy units at the side uh, for natural gas in the UK and for petrol and diesel, so that's transport, and for electricity. Um, so electricity, there's, so this is summer, lower demand in the summer and high demand in the winter. That's because in the UK, um, Air conditioning is not such a big thing when we <clears throat> we're so delighted when we have hot sunny weather that we kind of just fling the windows open and let some let some air in. We don't sort of whack up the air conditioning units, um, <clears throat> and so actually energy demand, electricity demand in particular decreases um, in the winter when it's long long nights, more lighting usage, uh, some electric heating load on there as well, um, but li but lighting more time spent indoors basically um, using appliances and so on. So. So there's a bit of difference between summer and winter demand, but if we look at natural gas, 
and, uh, and the big difference here is heat demand. The, the difference between kind of summer and winter in terms of heat demand is, is enormous. Um, and there's a, few, there's a few issues there. One is how we deal with that. So one is sh time shifting. So if we're going to, for example, do electrification, if we're saying we're going to replace natural gas with electricity for heat, uh, let's say we're going to do that with heat pumps. Now, heat pumps are very efficient. Um, so you could probably replace, they, ha they have a, a, an efficiency which you can, is, you can present as, as greater than one because they're basically harvesting energy from outside the heat pump itself. So they use less electricity to put in than the heat they gather from the surrounding environment by a factor of kind of a two and a half to three. So what that means is that you wouldn't use, if we electrified, you wouldn't necessarily need the same amount of um, energy as we have in our primary natural gas. Um, but even if you shrunk that, you're going to end up maybe with electricity, you might end up with a profile that's kind of something like, something like this. Um, but that's, you're still basically going to have a, a big impact on your winter electricity node. You, you're still going to have a a big issue on the seasonal difference between summer and winter. So you're either going to have to build enough electricity capacity that you can serve winter and then have it sitting there doing nothing in the summer, <clears throat> or you're going to build electricity capacity, for example, somewhere in the middle, and then you're going to overgenerate in the summer, and then you're going to shift that generation to the to the winter. And um, so, and there's very there are no great super efficient um, affordable ways to do that obviously one of the ways to potentially do long-term seasonal energy storage on a large scale is to is to do our um, power to power to gas <coughs> power to power to x someone mentioned yesterday power to x um, and turn electricity into hydrogen store the hydrogen and then use that to generate electricity in the winter so even if we electrify heating, arguably there's a role for hydrogen because we'll then need to shift big. We'll need to balance seasonally big differences in electricity. So the other way, of course, is that you replace natural gas um, for heating with hydrogen for heating. And so um, that gets us back to anything from blending it into natural gas networks, ultimately potentially using um, dedicated hydrogen networks, but replacing conventional gas boilers and gas appliances cookers with ones that can work on hydrogen. So, so there's there's kind of there's two battles there around heating. One is one is actually direct how you do the heating, uh, and so hydrogen it's competing really there with electrification. Um, but you could argue that even if we go down an electrification route in countries like this, and, and there are many of the, I mean, I've seen similar pictures for the Netherlands and, and, and most northern countries would have a similar sort of profile. It might not be gas. It depends what they use as heating already. Um, but you get big seasonal differences where there's big seasonal differences in weather and temperature and, and daylight hours and so on. And so then you get into if everything's electric, you still get into issues about seasonal storage and seasonal energy shifting, which <laughs> potentially plays into, into the role of, um, of hydrogen as well. Um, I mentioned this yesterday, the French natural gas operators report. Um, and we mentioned a little bit about blending, which I don't need to replace some of this, but these, these were kind of points that they make, uh, obviously, because they're trying to keep uh, their natural gas network pipelines as, as kind of assets that still have a role. Um, and it ties back with some comments that came up on day one about um, how we move energy about, whether we use um, electricity, electricity grids or whether we use hydrogen networks. Um, they point out, I mentioned grid losses of kind of six or seven uh, percent. They, they reckon that um, losses over natural gas pipelines are very small, so there's some efficiency gains there. Um, I mentioned this one the other day, this idea of a line pack, um, the idea that in an electricity network you have to have exactly the same going in as is going out at any moment in time uh, to keep your grid frequency um, in, in place. Um, 
and if you've got so if you've got a mismatch of supply and demand you have to basically either increase supply or decrease supply or increase demand or decrease demand and by doing things like um, demand response or battery storage or whatever else it may be with gas networks you there's some in, in flexibility built in because you can just adjust the pressure so if demand drops you don't instantly have to reduce supply you just you can keep putting supply in and just build up the pressure in the, in the network a little bit there's limits to doing that of course um, and within the infrastructure as a whole not just the pipelines but the various storage things there's they reckon there's an awful lot of energy storage this that's the number they came up with the, for the french network so that inherent interseasonal storage capability is is there and another one i mean this these kind of things are important we we focus a lot on on cost um and the kind of thermodynamics and efficiency and all that kind of stuff but this goes back to really that my chart from yesterday about things like deployment challenges so we had supply chain challenges on one on one axis and we had deployment challenges on the other this very much comes into deployment people in germany for example uh <coughs> again if there's any germans on here then feel free to disagree but <coughs> my the general sense i get is that they're quite happy with um renewable power infrastructure they're, they're not they don't greatly object to the site of wind farms and so on but there's been real problems trying to get grid lines built um whereas gas infrastructure especially especially with existing gas infrastructure is already is underground it's buried it's acceptable you can bury power lines but that puts the cost up even more i think it's about 10 or 11 times as expensive roughly obviously depending on location and conditions but 10 times the cost to to bury power cables is to um, hang them on on power lines so so having existing infrastructure that's invisible is also um, is also handy. Now, if you have to build new infrastructure and bury it, then that's become slightly problematic because equally people don't like having um, disruption of streets being being dug up and and so on. So, uh, so in terms of heating, there are some inherent advantages, obviously, from using using gas networks and there are some some big challenges in fact around around things like seasonality um okay i'm going to come back to some of these questions because some of them don't really relate to what we're doing here but um sebastian asked do we have an order of magnitude of storage capacity required for seasonal storage, assuming natural gas is blended with some hydrogen in winter. Um, well, you'd have to, that's going to depend on various things, the magnitude. Um, you'd have to look at, you'd have to look at the, the difference in heat demand in the various, in the location you were talking about. Um, you'd have to, magnitude of storage capacity you'd have to look at obviously the blend you're talking about natural gas versus hydrogen um and you'd have to look at how heat is currently being provided so in the for example the ratio between natural gas heating and other sources particularly electrical heating varies um, quite substantially from country to country you'd also be looking at things like um how many people are on on gas grid and how people are off gas grid and so on so um but, but it's it's going to be it's going to be large amounts um simply i mean you could do a rough cap rough estimate looking at that previous chart um but you're into into lots of terawatt hours of um <coughs> of storage capacity so but the the issue here um the slide here where they're <coughs> they're looking at very large numbers one of the one of the, the points they're trying to make is that the gas network potentially has the capacity to be able to be able to do that because we do tend we do tend to store um gas seasonally anyway um and obviously countries have um store oil over long periods of time have strategic reserves of oil gas storage um in the uk we actually shut down some <laughs> one of our biggest gas storage um fields not so long ago so again you could come back come back to issues about energy security and so on that sort of comes into that as well um with the same issue for heating applied to um air conditioning demand in summer months for hot climates and what about district heating cooling um yes i i yeah i mean we could talk not just about 
um, heating, but thermal applications, if you like. Um, so yeah, there'll be other countries where there's a big difference between um, demand seasonally because of air conditioning. The, the difference there is that air conditioning is, is for the vast extent, uh, run on electricity. So that's a really a current seasonal difference between electricity demand. What we're talking about here is a seasonal difference with electricity, which is relatively small, but a seasonal difference with heat, which is enormous. And how do we, it's back to our sector coupling. How do we, um, if we're going to electrify, if we're going to replace some of that heating demand, which currently isn't electric with electricity demand, we get into big numbers. With, with air conditioning, that demand is all really electricity demand. So it kind of, it's managing a demand that already exists rather than swapping it from a different a different fuel. Uh, district heating, yes, good. There are, depending where you are, um, if you're countries where district heating is, is a big thing. Um, clearly, if you can heat using um, a clean fuel rather than a, a, a non-clean fuel, then that's that potentially has a role. Um, you'd be competing there with, particularly things like, I guess, biomass has been one of the things that has replaced uh, district heating, potentially geothermal. Um, so you, again, you, it'd be very market specific as to what hydrogen was competing with. Uh, what are the pressure ranges in the gas network? Ooh, um, I think most gas networks are in, we're in the kind of tens of bars <coughs> from a, a kind of, <coughs> Yeah, from a, a few tens of bars to um, several tens of bars. Uh, I think that uh, transmission networks. I don't think you really get much beyond about six, seventy, or eighty bar. But I'd have to, I'd have to go away and really look up the numbers for that. But we're in tens of bars and, and fluctuating between low tens and high tens, rather than we're not into kind of hundreds of bars and so on. Um, and again, hydrogen pressure at the injection point. It depends where the where the injection point is. Um, so yeah, that will be, again, it's, it's location specific. Um, storage at the transmission network level may raise issues for industrial facilities, natural gas dependent processes. Um, yes. So I sort of kind of reiterates a point I think I made the other day. Uh, one of the weaknesses of the idea of hydrogen in the gas network, uh, particularly hydrogen blending in the gas network, is one of the limiting factors is going to be who's attached to that gas network. You can't just you can't just say, oh well, <clears throat> all the home customers will be fine with a 15% hydrogen blend. Let's do that. And then all your industrial customers who have much more sensitive equipment that will only run on 2% or 5% suddenly find all their <clears throat> equipment failing. So so do you, you you might have to limit to the lowest common denominator um and so the that sort of ties in with some of the conclusions on this on the, the slide where they're talking whoops where they're talking about um about these kind of things they're not they might in within the french gas network they came to the conclusion that diff the same approach wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be the the thing to do in every part of the network there might be some areas where you had 100% hydrogen. Otherwise, other areas where you stuck to 100% methane, and then others where you could where you could blend. Um, does hydrogen increase NOx? Yes, my understanding is it is it does. Hydrogen produces more nitrous oxide emissions than natural gas uh, because it it it, it combusts at a higher temperature. Um, and if you burn at a higher temperature, I I guess you just because um, the NOx comes from your <coughs> your um it's from the air that you use um the, the nitrogen in the air that you're mixing with your fuel um again i'm not you'd have to combustion chemist could go into more detail about what the mechanism um whereby higher temperature means higher nox emissions but that's i know that's just that's just a that's just a fact of, of burning hydrogen rather than burning um, methane there are some issue, other issues around hydrogen which um i've kind of not touched on which are certainly relevant to heating um around the blending side of it um in natural gas for example we add odorizing chemicals so that we can smell it so that if there's a leak we're aware um so you have to look at whether you can do what can you use the same um, chemicals to add to hydrogen do you need different ones there's also an issue with if you start putting it into fuel cells um, fuel cells need very pure hydrogen 
Um, and so that potentially is a problem if you've got odorizing um, additives in the in the hydrogen. So there's some there's some issues there. Uh, that would be the same, I guess, if you're um, if you're trying to separate out for for fuels for uh, mobility usage, you'd have to separate out pure hydrogen anyway. Um, there's lots of stuff um, needs to be worked out and 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 really, I guess, proven around. Um, the way it burns around safety around um impact on equipment around when it leaks how does it disperse how quickly does it disperse where does it disperse to and so on um and so whoops there are lots of um there are lots of things going on there are lots of there are lots of trials at the moment looking at blending to try and answer these kind of these kind of things um this is this is one there are this is 20 percent blending um it's the first stage of a trial which will last um a number of a number of years it talks about as you'll see down at the bottom into the so it, it started um there were various studies um which and reports which led to getting permission from um and this is important the health and safety executive so this is all about safety um it's not about the theory as to whether you can put hydrogen in with natural gas and stick it into someone's um, domestic setting. It's about proving that it's going to be safe. Uh, so they got permission to do that. They started the trial in January. They actually had to pause it because of the, um, the current virus situation. Um, but it'll go over several years. There's a, a trial, uh, relatively small one here in uh, the Midlands of, of the UK. Uh, and then, as it says, on into the early 2020s. <coughs> With all these things, if you're going to go to eventually commercialization, you start small, you do various demonstrations and you scale them up. There was one announced earlier this week in Scotland. Again, I think that was 300 homes they were talking about. So we're at that stage. There are some in France. There are various kind of hydrogen blending um, projects in, in various parts of the world. Um, and it's very much about this some of it's obviously demonstrating the technology and 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 proving that you can get it to work and so on but there's a lot around help around the safety side of it proving and being able to guarantee that if you make the switch over it's safe um and also being able to demonstrate um that it's not causing detrimental impacts on on the equipment in people's homes the pipe work in people's homes and so on and so on a lot of this will be determined not by what you can do in the network i would suggest but by the practicalities of it in at the end use site um and, all, and and also the perception of it at the end use site do people do people think it's it's um do people regard it as safe are people going to be happy with it um coming into the um <clears throat> into their homes so so plenty going around around, around heating and, and blending um again this was from the french study and it, it sort of makes that the point i made really just then um there are no numbers on here you'll notice at the side um there's no kind of this is sort of a it, as it says it says costs um so relative it's cost relative um to other things um this is the amount of hydrogen blend across the top um and the conclusion was that at, at small hydrogen blends up to about 10 percent, there was very little very little you needed to worry about there was a little bit of extra cost came in when you start going up to more like the 20 percent um you might have you have problems particularly with things like industrial equipment and so on um potentially pipe work and so on it's when you start going above 20 percent uh, then you get into it's this kind of stuff the big costs arise not on the network side they're arising at the um at the equipment side of things um, so that's going to be that's going to be the challenge really is not you can make it work on the network side um potentially with relatively little cost um obviously it gets more expensive the higher you go but you're going to have to persuade consumers to switch over um equipment uh, or you're going to have to pay for it them to switch over equipment again it's kind of where does the money come from is going to be a, an issue you can't i would suggest it's not going to be back to our energy trilemma of um equity um equity environmental um impact and so on uh, from an equity point of view you're not just i, I don't think you're, it's going to be acceptable for policy makers to say right we're going to mandate 
20% plus hydrogen blended into the system. And we're going to leave it to all the householders to worry about um, the fact they've got to replace their, their equipment. So again, it's going to be thinking about, about business models as to how, how, you, can, how you can fund that um, going forwards. And on, in terms of equipment, there are companies already, already um, producing um, equipment to do that. So hydrogen powered boilers, um, hydrogen powered turbines, which is on the, um, on one of the slides coming up. So, so in, again, in, in, in readiness, if you like, or anticipating where the market might move and also anticipating, well, if, if we allow people to just migrate away from using gas appliances towards, um, electric electric appliances then what have we got to sell if we're a boiler manufacturer you you kind of want people to go towards hydrogen appliances so they they do exist uh, backseat Worc worcester bosch also um i've talked about hydrogen powered um boilers and what they call hydrogen ready boilers this idea that you can have a boiler that currently you could buy it would work still on natural gas because that's what you've got now but if you started then to switch over the network to blends of hydrogen that boiler would be ready to accept it it doesn't mean without any modification but it might be just a small tweak an engineer, engineer might have to come along tweak a, a few of the settings within the boiler um, to work on hydrogen and the reason it's not not a straight swap other there are various kind of technical issues around what they call things like flame speed um light back means that you obviously want the flame to be um at the at the point where you want the flame to be but if the flame speed is too quick it can spread quicker than the gas is arriving and it spreads so it spreads back along the pipe that's what people mean when they talk about light back uh we mentioned yesterday about the fact that it's less energy um there are issues around the range at which it burns in terms of how much oxygen it's needed and so on and <laughs> um, we've talked about um NOx and so on. Um, there are some advantages, obviously. One of the big risks of natural gas heating is if your boiler is not um, it's not working properly, or if, if you're not, it's not, and in particular if it's combined with poor ventilation, uh, people die of carbon monoxide poisoning. If you're burning hydrogen, there's no carbon, so you're not you're not um, you're not going to produce any any carbon dioxide, uh, it's carbon monoxide uh, risk. So. So again, there's, it's not all, not all downsides. <clears throat> okay, I'm just aware of time. Um, so combustion is one thing for heating. Uh, I mentioned fuel cells. Again, there are, there are various um, manufacturers. Um, <clears throat> there you go, there's one of them. That's uh, a fuel cell. Now fuel cell, the advantage here is it's not just heat. Uh, it's power as well. So this is the idea of combined heat and power. If you can do both, he's obviously got his electric car as well in his very shiny house with no belongings. Um, now, you'd obviously have to think about the size of some of these units. Um, but that the advantage of combined heat and power, of course, is then you've got your potentially making use of high efficiency. So as, as power generation as, as well as heat generation, you can, you can potentially, you'd have to look at what the ratio between the two is and what makes most sense. Um, and again, you'd have to look at um, what fuel, whether what happens in terms of blend. So there are combined heat and power fuel cell units already. Um, and so that's the picture here showing kind of, um, units through this EU funded project and installation. Uh, big heavy concentration here in the, in the um, where is that? Is that Belgium or the Netherlands or one or the other? Um, and so, but they that's running on natural gas. Now that you can also have obviously fuel cells that run on hydrogen. You can have fuel cells that are fuel flexible um, and the, a number of manufacturers produce them, but as uh, Ceres is another hydrogen is another fuel cell manufacturer, they do natural gas fuel cells. They've developed a hydrogen, a pure hydrogen fuel cell. They kind of point out that fuel flexibility is all very well, but it does add cost, <laughs> add costs and complexity and so on. Um, so if you could go to, if you were going to full hydrogen, that would reduce the cost of the, the equipment. So there are some, again, there are some challenges or or some economic downsides to the idea of blending rather than going straight to a, 
<clears throat> a single using a single fuel it just adds it's more to think about it's more complexity and then in terms of bigger appliances you've probably seen uh, plenty of examples where turbine manufacturers are uh, <clears throat> are talking about having their turbines switch over to um, hydrogen there are already lots of turbines out there um, running on very high blends of hydrogen um, in particular at things like refineries and other industrial facilities where they burn um, flue gases and exhaust gases from um, the industrial processes which are not are often mixes of gas including quite, quite high hydrogen percentages um, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you can take a current you couldn't take a current gas power station and automatically feed in 20 percent hydrogen into it and it would all be fine and dandy um you the tolerances obviously the way these things are set up in terms of the calorific input into the turbines and so on is very precise so you you'd have there would be some modification needed um but the general feeling is that for gas turbines the level of modification is relatively relatively um small you're not you're not going to reinvent the turbine um there's some there's some reasonably small tweaks you can do to modify to um accept different um gas mixtures um and there are plenty this is siemens there are plenty of others um who have already talked about having 100 percent hydrogen combustion turbines by by certain dates normally towards the end of the towards the end of the decade now again if you're siemens or ge or your uh, mitsubishi um then arguably you've, there's a kind of survival element here um if people stop burning gas to produce power and do it in other ways then that's a big part of your business has disappeared so you're you're very keen to transition people over to um to burning hydrogen or, or burning gas hydrogen blends um, going forward so so that's a big driver of, of that market and then the other the a kind of i guess the thing we've kind of We've mentioned a couple of times along the way is this idea about storage. Um, if we're talking about particularly the power side of things, this kind of just summarizes the bit at the top summarizes what I've what I talked about. If you're going to go from, say, we want to do seasonal storage, if you want to, if you're starting off with electricity, you've got lots of surplus solar and wind, for example, in the summer because you've built huge amounts of capacity, um, and that's too much in the summer when your demand is low again swap feel free to swap summer and winter around depending where you live but talking about the uk low demand in the summer you're producing excess you don't want to curtail it you want to store it if you turn it to hydrogen store the hydrogen but however in whatever method in a gas pipeline or in, in dedicated hydrogen storage in salt caverns or whatever and then come winter you want to produce power again um by at highest efficiency putting it through a fuel cell but at lower efficiency putting it through a gas turbine the round trip of that is is pretty terrible from an energy point of view uh, because the electrolysis again your electrolysis is kind of 80 percent so if we start off with our it's it's one of our cycles we start off with 100 percent electricity um 80 percent conversion <clears throat> that's our electrolysis um things like we if we have to compress it losing a bit on storage and so on let's be generous and say that's kind of that's 90 percent um and then we've got to put it through a fuel cell and let's again be generous and say we get 60 percent of it back as electricity um then you can if you multiply those together um i've not got a calculator in front of me but you end up with a pretty a pretty low number uh, you end up with you end up down these kind of these kind of numbers um so so it's got and that's back to it's a bit like our comparison with battery vehicles against hydrogen vehicles you're back to this efficiency thing compared to putting it in a battery and, and getting 85 percent of it back um so this is a kind of levelized cost of you can do levelized cost of storage calculations that's a, probably a separate seminar um but levelized cost of storage you're basically adding up over some lifetime of your system the total amount of money you spend so that's the money you spend on building it the money you spend on operating it and the money you spend to 
charge in this case your storage to fill your storage the cost of the the fuel if you like that goes in so that will be either electricity so in this case if we're talking about electricity it's the cost of the electricity that's going in and then you divide it by the total amount of energy that you <coughs> discharge at the other end um, and you apply discount rates and so on to account for loss of um decreasing value with um over time so the whole present value thing um and basically what the, the summary here is if round trip efficiency is, is is poor then what that means is that your charging costs are going to be much higher to get the same amount out if that's out and then this is how much fuel the cost of fuel you have to put in if we're keeping that the same and our round trip efficiency is worse then we need a lot more we need to put a lot more fuel in and we're spending a lot more money we need a lot more electricity into our if you like hydrogen battery to get the same output in winter when we need it than we'll need to put into our conventional battery um and so how do we offset that and still be competitive in terms of cost so if that's going up basically we need these two to go down as the as the short answer well that's one answer is our system overall has to be cheaper and then again that's into then we're into scale so can we scale a can we scale hydrogen storage um such that when you get to very large scale storage systems it's actually it's cheaper to build and operate than stacking up containers shipping containers full of batteries and and yes and the answer is yes <laughs> um at there reaches a point and you could start to draw graphs where they cross over as there reaches a point where you're for a certain time duration and a certain volume of storage um the the lower costs are going to start to offer offset the the losses the energy you're losing in terms of efficiency alternatively of course it could be a combination of that and also not having to compete on levelized costs so if you're energy discharge is more valuable if you can sell it for more then again efficiency matters a bit less because your levelized cost can be higher so again if you're using it for peak time electricity in the winter then that will have a have a higher value and so and, and so the issue about efficiency is efficiency if you're comparing <coughs> if you're comparing like for like if you in, and then you're looking at the practicalities of getting something funded and you're looking at cost rather than just thermodynamics efficiency is one part of the equation but the key one is also the money <coughs> um, and so if you're going to offset efficiency terrible efficiency is going to have to be offset by much better costs and in the case of storage you won't get much better costs if you're doing it on a small scale but you will get much better costs if you're doing it on a on a very large scale and so that's why if you were to break down storage markets um really it's as we go down here to longer longer storage durations that um that potentially hydrogen starts to become of more interest um if you're talking about seconds to minutes so you're talking about balancing frequency or you're talking about um short-term reserves um to to very quickly step in if power plants drop offline and so on that's already being done and it's being done very successfully and it's being done um very competitively by um lithium-ion battery systems also by existing storage like pumped hydro and so on and in future and there are already trials doing this now and demonstrating it now um not just batteries within the grid but batteries on wheels plugged into people's houses what we call vehicle to grid um so but when you get to longer durations now if you kind of four to six hours there are already gas speaker plants in the states which are being out competed by uh battery systems um <clears throat> but potentially for longer if you talk about maybe eight ten hours um you could start to look at whether there's a crossover there between uh the cost of um, repurposing a gas power plant to run on on hydrogen would make sense but certainly when you get to these longer things when you get to tens of hours respectively days um it's not uncommon for example within within europe and i'm sure it's the same elsewhere to have days when you have three or four days in a row where um wind output is very low or you have three or four days in a low where it's sorts of cloud and your solar output is very low 
Um, again, doing that with certainly lithium ion batteries is, is not going <coughs> to stack up, I would suggest, on cost. There are other types of batteries that are emerging, what we call flow batteries. Um, there are there are other, or the alternative is you're going to have to have flexible power generators like gas in particular. Again, not necessarily, then you have to think, well, is it hydrogen or are there other clean sources of gas like biomethane? And certainly when you get to seasonal, as we've mentioned, that's where hydrogen uh, potentially gets to, to come into play. Um, okay, I think we're, we're nearly there. Um, we've covered most of the stuff. Um, again, just to make my usual thing that not one size fits all, uh, this is an interesting example which has had, um, had a, a bit of press coverage. Um, and I think quite an, quite a good one. Uh, this is a this is in as it says in Sweden. I don't need to, to read that, um, but there's a bit of detail on it. Um, the key point here is it's it's a relatively big housing lot, so there's a hundred whoops, hundred and seventy odd uh, dwellings which they've kind of re repurposed, um, renovated um, over a number of buildings. And the key, the key point I'll leave you to read the, the detail is it's a mixture of things. It's not it's not battery or hydrogen or heat pump. It's all of them. Um, they've got PV, they've got solar on each of the, the rooftops of the buildings. Um, they've got battery storage, the short duration storage. Um, they've got heat pumps which aren't shown on here, but there are heat pumps um, <coughs> to provide, um, to feed into the heating system. Uh, the battery bit of it, again, is for longer term. It's for smoothing out longer term um, issues. So they'll, they can use the, um, they can use electricity directly from PV. They can shift it over short time frames using the battery. Uh, they can use the heat pump when that's sufficient to meet the load. Um, but when they've got excess PV, they can convert to hydrogen, they can store the hydrogen, in this case in compressed tanks, and then they can use to feed that back into a fuel cell, uh, which is, again, that's and that's CHP, combined heat and power. So it's this kind of, I think, these kind of examples in the heat and power uh, sector, I think, are also worth, worth looking at, um, where it's, again, getting away from the idea it has to be one or the other every time but are there situations where hybrids bits of both make sense um now it may be easier to do that if you're doing a specific renovation for a set of buildings um these kind of things obviously will make less sense if we're talking about 10 million individual dwellings attached to a gas pipeline for example then you're more like you're more into okay well <coughs> what is it is it going to be cheaper to go through and retrofit those houses with heat pumps and just not bother with having them attached to the gas pipeline? Or is it going to be less disruptive to start phasing in hydrogen through the gas pipeline so that the only thing they have to do in the house <clears throat> ideally is swap an appliance and maybe there'll obviously have to be safety checks around the pipe work and so on. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so it, it may not always one size fits all, always look out for things that, um, that combine different solutions. Okay, I've been keeping half an eye on the, um, the Q&A section. You're probably all exhausted with, um, <laughs> with it all by now. Um, hydrogen in heating, you've mentioned that one. District heating, you mentioned the fuel cells have low efficiency. Um, yes, yeah, fuel cell CHP, uh, definitely. Electrolysis for storage. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned about capital recovery and the, the kind of cost structure and the cost profile of electrolysis um your the the hydrogen you produce and store is going to be more expensive if you've got a low load factor and again that's one of the issues around storage is um and that levelized cost number is the and in fact if i go back to that slide if the if the load factor is very small, where's my pen gone, then your um, your input, then your, your throughput effectively is going to be very small as well. Um, the slide doesn't really help. Um, so if load factor is small, then yes, you've paid for this kit, you've paid all that capex and your the amount of energy you're going to generate through it is, 
going to be very small, so the localized costs will go up. Uh, so load factor is certainly going to be a, um, an issue with that. Um, uh, yeah, session slides are already available. Um, I think Jamie gave you the link in the chat window, so go and have a look there. Um, development of fuel cells. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. I think fuel cells, I mean, there are where fuel cells have been talked about, obviously mobility, um, that very much depends on on what they're on the sectors. Now, one of the interesting points that's been made about fuel cells is that again, they're you can make them in a in a fairly modular fashion. So some of the, for example, Toyota when they're some of the electric, um, so the, the fuel cell truck, um, stuff they're talking about and Hyundai is the same is they're taking they're effectively taking the same fuel cell tech that they use in their cars and just um they just stack them up so they instead of like one fuel cell stack you have several um so that they can do it in a modular thing you don't have to invent a new fuel cell for a bigger application there's a few tweaks you have to do and so on but uh, effectively you can do it in a more modular fashion and uh, so that helps um in terms of I would I would say most people are looking at transport as in terms of volume market as being attractive, but I think the CHP side of things is 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 interesting as well. Um, if you're going to do it and station at a stationary level, then then obviously when they're trucking, it's all about the power to drive the wheels. Um, but if you're going to do it in a stationary setting, then I think it's going to have to be about the combined heat and power because from an economic point of view, you're basically that. <clears throat> Um, the efficiency is if you use CHP is 90 percent because you're using not just the 60 percent or 50 percent electricity you're using the the heat as well and having an economic value to that so I think that will make sense um and I guess I need to finish off um so I mean I've got closing discussion um these are slides I'd already we've already seen or this was just sort of linking it uh summarizing some of the stuff we talked about in terms of supply um, some of the challenges in terms of scaling up green um, electrolysis. Um, the, the economics is obviously a big thing. Uh, we saw yesterday that the, um, the supply of renewables is a big thing. For blue, it's all about CCS. Um, again, notwithstanding some of the um, emerging technologies that that's, are well worth watching around whether we can do this, whether the ways of producing hydrogen from fossil fuels without having to do with CCS. Whichever one you look at, um, these are going to be absolutely key. Um, we've talked a lot today and yesterday about demand. That's absolutely crucial. Does anyone actually want to buy this stuff? Um, policy is crucial because that will affect the value of what we're trying to sell um, compared to the fossil equivalent. And as I've suggested a number of occasions, um, moving this stuff about, if you can avoid moving it about, then great. Um, and in the short run, I think that will be a real, ad a real advantage for business models where you're not having, you're not adding so much between the produc produced cost and the delivered cost. Um, I'm, I'll flick through these because I've seen them before. Best early scale opportunities, <clears throat> some of the heavy transport op opportunities, and I would suggest some of the industrial existing opportunities and heavy um, emitters like steel and cement and so on. I would. I would, if you were put me on the spot, the kind of things I would pick out as as early scale, but but that's not to dismiss all the other opportunities in further forward. We talked about supply chain complexity. I don't need to repeat that. I think, and I've talked about um, routes to deployment as well, and some of the um, the drivers around that. Um, some questions that have popped in since. Um, from the point of view of investors, where are the majority of the investments taking place in which sectors? How big is the hydrogen market in terms of US dollars? What I am trying to know is how to make appealing <laughs> to an investor that has no idea about it and thinks it's expensive and risky. Um, well, I think if you're talking to an investor, I the kind of how big is the market? I think what you need to do is not just talk about the market. Well, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're doing hydrogen production, <clears throat> then potentially the whole market is relevant. But I, I would, I would start by well, what market you're talking about? Because one, one of, the, one of the good things about hydrogen, ultimately, and that's if you like on the slide, that's our, um, that's our transformed future. 
oops, is that it can do lots and lots of things. It can play in all sorts of different segments. In the short run, that can be, from an investment point of view, that can be a disadvantage because it's quite complicated. You're saying, oh, we could do this, we could do that, we could do the other, we could do lots of different things. But investors ultimately want to know, I've got this chunk of money, I'm going to give it to you, <clears throat> you're going to spend it on something and I'm going to get some money back. How's that going to happen? How much risk is there? Um, and so what they, they're interested in is, okay, show me, show me a customer, show me how much they're going to spend, show me why they're going to spend it, how long they're going to spend it for, and have you got a kind of contract over a certain amount of time? So in, in the immediate term, if you're trying to attract investment, um, I think you kind of are having the big picture and saying, look, this is where it could go in future is great, but they want to know, okay, show me a show me a specific case, um, show me where where specifically my money's going and where it's going to come back. So you have to think about the stuff we talked about, about um, segmentation, customers, um, policy risk uh, or policy opportunity, back, go back to our SWOT analysis and do a bit of that. Um, and so look at, well, how big is the market you're specifically talking about? Um, and you, so you're looking at levels of, in current markets, that's easier to evaluate, obviously. That's one of the advantages of current markets. We can say how big the market for refining is. We can say how big the market for um, ammonia is. We can look at things like how much steel manufacturing and cement manufacturing goes on and, and look at that. Uh, with with things like transport, you, you'd have, you're making assumptions about what, um, percentages are going to re be replaced over what time and again with all of these you then have to look at the competition um so in many cases you can't get away from the fact it's risky um which is why at the moment you're not really i mean again people can correct me if they disagree and they've got projects they know know about but project finance like debt going to your commercial bank and and getting a loan for 80 percent of your project at, at a nice low debt level and being able to leverage um, for a good return is not something that you're going to be able to do a lot of the stuff that you read about is um a lot of the stuff you read about is not reached financial close it's plans projects it's proposals and so they're looking around for finance at the moment um, and and some of the stuff that's that's on the ground and happening, a lot of that is is balance sheet. It's 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 big companies um, who are use who recognise that they need to go in that direction. They've got to spend some money uh, to to see how risky it is, um, because without doing that, they can't go to a um, they can't go to investors that have lower risk appetites to do that. So at the moment, one of the challenges is that you're probably looking at investors that have higher risk appetites. It's hard to get away from that because you can't point to 50 projects on the ground and how well they're running. <clears throat> um, whereas if you're going to, if you're going to build a PV plant, investors know about them, they've invested in loads of them before, <clears throat> the cost of finance will be lower. And, and that's a challenge. It's, it's one of these kind of hurdles the industry has to get through because cost of finance has a big impact on the cost of the eventual um, project and the, and the product you're producing as well so i've kind of rambled on a bit around the answer but um but that's probably there's too much in there probably we'd have to take that offline a bit um uh, blah, 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 blah. it looks like hydrogen projects are mainly conceived at large scale and pushed by big players do you see a space for small players um personally i do yeah i think uh, it's not surprising that big players with deeper pockets are pushing a lot of the projects at the moment the bigger scale stuff um and i think it's important to have again with these kind of the kind of diagram here what i'm not trying to do is to say that the stuff at the top is um is uninteresting this the aiming big is is good um but i think there's a big role for also starting starting small um you'll never get to big unless you start having projects on the ground and running and so on. Um, and also I do see in the same way that when renewables came about or started to, things like solar and wind started to grow um, significantly, one of the shifts that's happened in that sector is from a sector that was all about utilities and great big power plants and centralized generation and big grids to move it about and all that kind of stuff, one of the things that renewables has done, one of the most disruptive things that renewables has done has, is to shift 
generation is to shift um, ownership um, closer to customers <coughs> to have much more distributed systems. Um, and that's a good thing, both from customers point of view, potentially um, in terms of control. Um, but even if customers don't own them, it's a good thing from the system point of view in terms of diversification and um, reliance and so on. It's a bit like the internet rather than mainframes, if you like, a simplistic way of looking at it. Uh, with hydrogen, I, 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 I don't see why you can't have a similar shift where the oil and gas sector is all about big oil and gas companies dominating the chain, controlling the price, uh, <clears throat> big initial production and as a complicated supply chain to get it down to individual end users. Um, whereas in moving to hydrogen, I think there's a very big future in not removing that entirely. There'll always be big players that have the money and the resources to, um, to do big scale stuff in the same like in solar, you have big scale utility solar farms, but I think there's a big opportunity for small, um, small scale production, uh, especially production close to demand and so on. So, so yeah, I would say that's a um, that's a, a thing. Before people drift off, I was just going to um, launch another poll. Um, I can answer some questions while you while you think about it. <clears throat> yeah, but feel free to answer that poll as we go along. Thanks, John. I've just joined you. I don't know if you saw me. Um, but yeah, it's very good. First time I've, I've heard that, obviously. Uh, probably because it's the first time you delivered it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I'd, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the questions there are all sort of correct. On, on the one, I guess, around investment, and it's something we discussed recently uh, on, the, on the network. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the clear signal is going to be policy uh, yeah. and, and you know forcing demand so uh, next week is our sort of policy focus week um, so everyone is invited to, to join that that starts on, on Monday with access to to a number of, sort of presentations including sort of four or five from European governments who will be um, you know laying out their roadmaps for, for policy so it's looking like a lot of um, uh, a lot of governments are obviously putting in mandates in terms of blending mandates and uh, different countries are you know, talking about different levels. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's, there's going to be sort of uh, a, a mass supply market, which is, is going to um, obviously require uh, investment. So um, they are thinking about how to make it bankable um, so that people can yeah. begin to invest in, in, in production facilities, etc. Uh, and that's certainly smart energy. Uh, who, who are waiting for that um, signal so that they can they can invest the money into their um, their project? We're looking to speak to I think just out of interest to Arrowsmith in Australia because they recently closed you know three hundred million dollars worth of financing from a fund in in Hong Kong. Um, so we're trying to trying to understand how they took the risk out um, of that investment or, or whether it is a you know, genuine investment, but how how. How close it is to sort of actually happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Policy definitely. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm quite, I'm pretty optimistic on policy. There's enough. Um, I mean, it's there's obviously lots of noise at the moment, but there's there's enough. There's so much noise, and and some of the kind of I don't know, like the leaked report from the EU uh, the other day in terms of the potential post virus economic. Um, economic program that had some specific mentions around supporting hydrogen and so on so um and and certainly here in the uk there's 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 money going in from a policy point of view i mean i guess that's the other way of looking at the investment case is to look what grants there are look what um funding look what there's quite a lot of eu specific things going in i'd say in the, the government here has, has invested um i mean in the grand scheme of things small amounts but i think the last one was something like up to a billion pounds um for various projects a lot of those a lot of those are very targeted around um industrial applications and so on but looking at yeah. looking at the poll no one's depressed so that's good <laughs> um <laughs> i was dubious before but now i'm more interested that's good i haven't changed my mind it's gonna be fantastic i haven't changed my mind it's okay still not sure but better equipped oh that's good that was I'm glad that's the um the most popular one because at least it means that you've um you've learned something hopefully or you've <laughs> you've got something out of it so that's that's handy. Um, there was yeah there was a discussion around policy and local content and um, 
so the local content piece is interesting if you take into 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 um into account uh jobs uh, and obviously the the linkage from the industry is now going to be about how can hydrogen create jobs and, and mm. repair vastly damaged um economies uh, and so yeah local content rules and, and stuff so we had a deep dive um, recorded yesterday around um you know, local content policies and, and linking that to, to to any sort of government policy to create jobs and and, and yeah it's, there's there's clear yeah clear momentum in, in that um in that way news i think overnight was it overnight yeah in denmark's 37 billion euro infrastructure investment for two um green islands or um offshore wind islands with the potential to to um to have um hydrogen factories on them uh set to be you know denmark's largest infrastructure investment um so yeah that's a it's a lot <laughs> yeah uh, but, uh, it's good okay um i think i've covered most of the questions uh i mean if people have them afterwards then just post them up on the on the network either just we can post them publicly and i'll have a go at answering them or you can message me through the through the platform uh and i can answer them that way so um yeah the as i say the slides jamie gave you the link earlier it'll be on the platform um and i think yeah i think that's i think we're done yeah the recording will be processed uh it usually takes a while but i'm trying to get that over late late this evening uh, and post that. Uh, as I said, next week is is a policy policy event, which is happening on the Wednesday. Well, the live sessions are happening on the Wednesday. The on-demand stuff will be accessible. Now, well, it's actually accessible now, so you can go over to um, the the workshop um, side of the the site. You should be able to to access through. We have sent some invitations. I'll just double check um, uh, that that you or this group has received those invitations uh and then john is back in various different courses there's the the longer heroes format which is happening again in august um we've got obviously the monthly conference which is always occurring on the last wednesday of each month this this month is policy next week and then next month is hydrogen rollout strategies we're also confirming a, a deep dive course into hydrogen in china um and uh, yeah, some, some various other courses. So, uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll uh, be able to develop some some content um, that's of interest. Uh, if anyone needs uh, any other specific training needs, or indeed wants to speak to John directly, clearly I think they can contact John. Uh, but also, we're, we're always open to ideas for for new courses or, or other areas that that you want to explore. Um, particularly as as the the hydrogen economy begins to begins to get going hopefully so um with that thanks a lot john it was very good okay. and um we look forward to, to everyone uh, interacting and, and taking part in the platform yeah okay tomorrow everyone cheers thank you bye bye